So this police officer comes and he goes, I have witness reports that say you were going, you know, X amount of miles per hour. You kid, I'm gonna make sure you go to jail. I'm gonna make sure that they press charges and you're going to jail because you should not be on the street. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Prophetic Mentality Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Southern California's very own Sheikh Mustafa Omar. A little bit about Sheikh Mustafa for those of you that don't know him. Sheikh Mustafa spent some years studying Islam in the East. He spent time in Nadut al Ulama in Lucknow, India, and Nadr al Azhar in Cairo, Egypt. Sheikh Mustafa holds bachelor's degrees in theology and Islamic law from the European Institute of Islamic Sciences and a master's of Islamic studies from the University of Gloucestershire. He is the current education director at the Islamic Institute of Orange County and founder of the California Islamic University. As always, links to our guest's social media and about pages are included below in the description if you're watching on YouTube or in the podcast description if you're listening through your favorite podcast app. Now on to the good stuff. We originally scheduled with the Sheikh about one hour to discuss the topic of masculinity in Islam. However, we ended up recording for almost four hours with the Sheikh. Honestly, the time just flew by. So, since the recording was so long, we decided to split up this episode into two parts. In part one, what you're listening to or watching right now, we go into the Sheikh's personal story on how he ended up on the path of knowledge. And let me tell you now, it's a pretty crazy story. And Sheikh Mustafa is an amazing storyteller. He had me engaged in cracking up the whole time. In part two, we get into the topic of masculinity in Islam, and we discuss some relevant legislation that has currently gone into effect in California. And that's all I'm going to say because you're going to have to watch this one for yourselves. Recording this episode was delightful in every way. So I hope you too enjoy listening to it as well. Assalamu alaikum and on with the show. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Prophetic Mentality Podcast. Today I'm joined by my co-host Munir and we are joined by a very special guest, Sheikh Mustafa Omar from uh, Orange County. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. How are you doing today? Doing excellent. Alhamdulillah. Today we wanted to have you on to discuss... um, uh, the certain topic of masculinity in, in Islam. Uh, inshallah, we want to get into that a little bit later. But first, I wanted to kind of touch base on your kind of your journey to getting where you are now. Um, I know your journey to Islam and being a sheikh is probably not as linear as most would think. Uh, so can we probably get into that a little bit first? Sure. Uh, where should we start? Uh, high school. High school. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So high school. Yeah, I went to public school. I went to Tustin High School. Okay. Um, You know, kind of my mentality was uh, the way that I was raised, kind of semi-culturally practicing Muslim. Uh, We probably never prayed outside Jummah prayer. Okay. uh, When it was convenient. Right. Because I'm in school. So obviously not happening that much. We would go for Eid prayer. Uh, so not really much Islam. Um, most, so like Eid Muslims. Kind of like Eid Muslims, but maybe like one notch above. Sometimes Juma Muslims, like you mm-hmm. know. So, so yeah, so a little, little bit one notch. We're not, we weren't that bad. You know? so, <laughs> and uh, so that basically meant that uh, most of my friends were non-Muslims. Right? Okay. So my Muslim friends were only pretty much like at parties. Either I'd have like a Hindu friend or a Muslim friend because my parents socialized with with those people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Other than that, I really wouldn't see anyone else. So almost all my friends are non-Muslims. All my, uh, you know, things that I do and people I hang out with, everything else is pretty much influenced by non-Muslim. So that's kind of what high school was for me. And then uh, what happened was in high school, probably somewhere around junior year, uh, we went on a family trip to Mecca. Okay. And when I came back from Mecca, that was like a, a huge thing for me because I'd never seen Mecca before. It was like a huge cultural shock, you know, Azan <laughs> five times a day, this and that. You're going to the masjid. So I actually became kind of interested in Islam a little bit uh, after doing Umrah and visiting Mecca for the first time. So I came back and I started like, you know, I want to take this Islam thing, you know, seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started... Um, I started praying a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started, you know, telling my friends, you know, Islam is this, Islam is correct, and Islam is an awesome religion. But it was kind of like a, uh, my own version of Islam. Whatever you kind of perceive from the culture that you kind of. No, not only that. So the thing is, I didn't really like the culture. So I was kind of, a, I was kind of a very anti-culture uh, kind of guy. Okay. Yeah. So for me, if I, if I'm going to practice Islam, it's got to make sense to me. So I got a Quran translation. 
and anything that kind of made sense to me i'd be like yeah this is what islam says if it didn't mm. make sense to me i'd be like i don't i don't want it. so it's an individual education very individualized okay. uh to the point where i'm like you know what it doesn't make sense we're gonna pray in arabic right because i don't know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so i'm just gonna pray in english so i started praying in english you know if i'm late for school you know i, I used to drive to school a junior uh, I'm like, you know, oh, it's okay. I'll understand. I'm just going to pray while I'm driving to school, you know, but in English. <laughs> so so it's just kind of like this custom-made uh, version of Islam that I kind of got into initially. Uh, eventually, it led to, like, uh, rejecting hadith, too. So I'm like, oh, these, these hadith don't make sense. So Quran-only Muslim. So Quran-only, English, prayer type of Muslim. Uh, that's where it got to, like, around high school. I mean, that's where people are nowadays most of that's the time. That's where people are, yes. You're, you're an OG. So, so, so for, for me, it's like... You were ahead of the curve, actually. Exactly. I'm like, you, you guys are doing something like that's way back in the days, man. Like, been there, done that, you know? So, so for me, it's like, you know, you guys aren't doing anything original, you know? So, so, so that was high school, right? Okay. And then from high school, basically, I go into college. And then in my first year in college, I attend this class on philosophy and... Uh, this class basically breaks down my entire worldview. Of course. Uh, yeah. And I basically stop believing in God and I end up becoming an atheist. Was it like just an intro to philosophy course? It or? was an intro to philosophy course. It was a critical thinking course specifically. I still remember the book. The book was called um, How to Think About Weird Things. And uh, it got like from quotes from like Aristotle and talk. It talks about like it's a very modern um, like uh, analysis of American society. So that's the thing that really got to me. It's like I used to be, I was always very skeptical about, you know, people always making claims, jinn, you know, everything is jinn related, everything is spiritual related. Mm -hmm. You know, people believe in all sorts of things and they always attribute those things to something else. Mm -hmm. So I've been, you know, generally raised with like a, a type of skepticism. So when the teacher started talking about, you know, uh, this many Americans still believe in Santa Claus, and I was just like, they really believe in this is stupid you know and then they said then they started talking about oh they still they believe in the tooth fairy and like for me it's like almost like a trauma it's like you know why was i lied to that you know there's a truth there's a tooth fairy like i don't i, I don't do this i don't want to do this to my own kids right yeah like this idea of oh look there's a tooth fairy and then all of a sudden oh yeah well by the way we just made it up to you know to, to make you feel good but then you're like, well, wait a minute. If my parents lied to me about these things, what other things did they lie to me about? Yeah, so yeah. it creates a sense of skepticism, or maybe that's just my personality. No, that's. I think that's the, that goes well with kids because they're they're very easily, they're very uh, they they'll perceive these things and they'll take it on as a reality very yeah, easily. Exactly. You know, they'll just believe it because they have that fitra. Exactly. In them. Exactly. And then when you break it, and once you break the trust, right? And you've yeah. tr you've they've trusted yeah. you, right? You break that trust when they find it out. They start thinking, wait a minute, is this the only thing that they have lied to me about? Mm -hmm. And then you start questioning. And when they've lied to you about a lot of things, it just it causes a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. you know? So you said this philosophy class really hit you hard, yeah. and I hear that a lot. You know, a lot of kids they go to a quote unquote philosophy class and it yeah. breaks them down. What? So I, we never, I don't think we went to a philosophy course or freshman year or anything. Right. And I'm always skeptical, like, what could they possibly tell you that breaks <laughs> down a man to like, oh, yeah. this is all, is it just so much confusion or they slip in the ideas with, oh, people believe in Santa Claus, Tooth Fairy and God, and it's all in the same conversation. That's, that's exactly what happened. So okay. basically it was in the exact same conversation. I remember yeah. it very clearly. They slip so, it in. They slip it in. So they're like, you know, the people still believe in the Tooth Fairy. Oh, people still believe in uh, uh, fairies. And they, they put the statistics, so it looks very scientific. It's yeah. like this many people, serve some survey somewhere, this many percentage of Americans believe in fairies. I'm like, come on, they believe in like little fairies like uh, from Peter Pan or something yeah. like that. And then they go, and this many people believe in angels. So I'm kind of like... That's the next step. It's the next step. So I'm kind of like yeah. shaky. I'm like, well, kind of, well I, am, I am believing in Islam. I guess we kind of do believe in angels, but then the way they're portrayed in society... Do they really look like that? Maybe it's overdone. So you start to get to that level, and then they go, and then this many percentage of people still, look at the word, still, still believe yeah. in God, no, right? So, so I'm hearing that, still believe in God, and I'm just, I, I'm in a state of confusion now. I'm like, wait a minute, so what do you mean still? I, I go in there, my perception, you know, 1990, late 90s, early 2000, is people in America believe in God. Like, that's my understanding, mm -hmm. right? My, yeah. I assumed that even my non-Muslim friends, whatever religion they are, they still believe in God. They believe in something. They believe in, yeah, believe in some kind yeah. of higher power or something like that. So I go in there. So the teacher is kind of like hinting. And he, obviously, it's pretty clear he's an atheist. But I didn't know that. 
right? So most people don't know what their religious persuasions of their own teachers are. So I go in there, this guy's definitely an atheist, but I don't recognize that. So then he goes, and he asks this question, he goes, how many of you still believe in God? Right? So he goes, just raise your hand. How many of you still believe wow. in God? So this is what broke everything for me. Because I was the, I'm, I'm putting my hand up, and there's only one guy in the whole class who puts his hand up. And that guy is like the super annoying missionary guy who knocks on your door on a Sunday morning that no one wants to associate with. He's like that, the most annoying guy in the world, the guy who's like the Bible thumper, right? Yeah. yeah. And I'm just looking, I'm like, wait a minute, something is wrong here. It's, am I like that guy? And that, 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 I was just like, hey, you want to be cool? That, that just, that, that just messed up everything for me. And then from there, it was just a down, down trajectory. Yeah. So, so it started in college, started, freshman, st- freshman year in college. Freshman That's kind college, of, yeah. And what kind of, do you, were you involved with, or where'd you go to school first? Like, I should ask. College. 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 I went to UCI Irvine. UCI Irvine. UCI. Okay. Yeah, UCI. And did you join the MSA at all during that time? <laughs> it's an interesting story about MSA. So this is happening in freshman year. Yeah. I'm living on campus. Even though my parents live in <clears throat> Tustin, I'm like living in Irvine on campus. Like, that's, uh, yeah, that's very common actually. A lot of first years, they just end up living on campus. So yeah, I, I insisted. I'm like, I need to live on campus. You know? okay. So I, I want my freedom from parents and you know, I want to be independent and all that stuff. So I'm living on campus. I don't know a single Muslim. Mm-hmm. Right? There's, there's, I don't know a single Muslim on campus. Uh, all of my friends in the dorms, they're all non-Muslims, which is yeah. direct trajectory of where I was in high school anyways. And for the listeners, actually, UCI, there's a huge Muslim msa population yes yes there, there's there a, a big big number of yes. people there yes. it's not a small time school yes exactly yes there's a lot of muslims but i was not affiliated with them at all so yeah. i'm not cultural either so i'm not affiliated with like the pakistani student association or whatever uh, yeah. is there or, or any of these cultural clubs so then all of a sudden i'm walking down campus one day and someone kind of notices me and they're like hey what's your name i'm like uh yeah mustafa you know <laughs> and it's like hey are you muslim I'm like, uh, yeah. On Fridays? Like, yeah. <laughs> At that time, I was just like, yeah, kind of. You should join the, you should join the MSA. I'm like, what are you talking about, you know? It's like the Muslim Students Association. So at that time, I was just like, I don't want to have anything to do with you guys, right? Mm-hmm. So they, like, someone saw me. They tried to recruit me. And I was just like, look, not interested. And the guy, like, really, you know, tried really to pushed eagerly. Me. He's like, come on, you know, it'd be really good. You're going to make new friends and this and that. I'm like... I don't, no, I'm I'm not in, I'm not interested in that stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, that was my one experience of trying to get recruited. So I was not part of MSA at all. And the second thing was that I was walking by one day, and there was like a a, Palestine, a protest for Palestine taking place. Of course. All right, and uh, the guys were like you know yelling and you know free Palestine and this and that. And I'm walking by, and someone kind of sees me, and they're like, hey, you look like you look kind of like you're Muslim or something, you know. <laughs> uh, Come over here and join us, you know. And there's like basically there's Zionists on this side, and there's like Palestinian MSA on this yeah. side. So like, c- c- come on this side, join us, you know. So I'm just like, wh- like what? What's <laughs> what's going? On? And I had been to Jerusalem before, right? So mm-hmm. I I know, uh, you know what it's like. But I didn't really know much about the issue outside, like from a religious perspective. I just know yeah. the political perspective. So I'm just like, no, you guys, you know, you guys seem to be like yelling and screaming and like. You don't seem to be very objective, you know. So I just like I'm like no, I, I don't want to really join you guys. Like if you guys, you guys are a little bit more quiet. Like I know I've been to Jerusalem, but it's like what you guys are doing. Like no, man, I'm not interested. And then the, so it's a bad look for me. I already got affiliated with the missionary guy. I can't. I can't. Yeah, because because again, like one of the things about <clears throat> philosophy, right? It's like the idea, the ideal Socrates type philosopher. Was that your major, by the way? No, or that what? was not my major. It was just oh. like a kind of like a, a interest and a passion. You did comp sci, didn't you? I did comp sci, yeah, computer mm-hmm. science. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, computer science. But uh, so I, I'm very, very into like science, science and this and that. So, so it, they kind of overlap, hard yeah, sciences yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So for me, it was like you know the, the ideal thinker, objective person who's not being biased. I'm I'm against this bias that kind mm-hmm. of I grew up with a oh, cultural bias, people are religious bias, this and that. So it's like you should be very calm and poised and relaxed and explain your argument rather than, you know, emotionally, you know, yelling or screaming. So that was my mentality at the time. So I went through and I still think there's some validity to that, sometimes depending on where you are. But I walked through and I'm like, you know, I don't wanna I don't wanna be any part of this. And that those were my two experiences with, the with Muslims on campus for like my entire freshman year. Wow. That's, that's it. I've never encountered anyone else outside of that. And do you ever go back 
to that, or do you ever join the MSA at all? Throughout yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, okay, so okay. yeah, when I come back to Islam, so the the ir- irony is when I join MSA, I I join uh, kind of I join MSA, and the same guy who is recruiting me, there's two guys. Yeah. Same guy who's recruiting me, they become my close friends. Must They're be. also in computer science, and then I end up becoming their teacher. <laughs> so that's the irony. So I'm teaching a class, and there's students in my class, and they're like, "Remember two years ago when we tried to recruit you?" And you're like, "Just get away from me." He's like, "Can you imagine? Like, like this would have happened. Like, you end up becoming our teacher, and you're giving the khutbah on campus, and we're like, we're sitting in front of you. Like, we could have never imagined that. Like, we thought we're like the Muslim guys. We're trying to recruit this guy. This guy's running away from us, and now like the whole situation flipped. He's like, you know, this is how uh, Allah changes, you know, things. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so what kind of guides you back? I mean, it, you seem like you're pretty adamant at this point. A lot of people don't really bounce back mm. from that, you know, unless there's some experience they go through or yeah. some sort of something happens like to mortality. What? Yeah. Something. Yeah. yeah. So that played a role, although I don't like to say that, like, I don't like to say this is the specific thing, right? It's everything is a process in, Correct. in my understanding is a process of going away from Islam. There's a process of coming towards Islam. It's not like just one thing just triggers all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the process was kind of brooding, brewing in me uh, in terms of, like, the lifestyle that I was living. You know, I started going to, like, you know, nightclubs. I got into, like, uh, I got into, like, ele- electronica music. Oh, uh, that's, so that's like, big in the early 2000s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I had, like, a friend. He was Did armed. you shuffle? Uh, <laughs> no. No? Okay. No, no, no. Uh, but uh, I, I had... Uh, a, an Armenian friend who pretty much got me into this and he's a DJ now so he was computer science switched to music and now he's he's like a professional DJ we're still in touch um, so he got me into this music he's like this is the most intellectual music because I used to listen to also I at that time I was listening to like uh, like alternative listening to like rock stuff like that before that I had listened to you know rap when I was younger I listened to like uh, uh, what else like dance and you know uh, kiss fm type of stuff and mm-hmm, all that mm-hmm. so at that phase i was like at rock basically alternative rock things mm-hmm. like that and he's like no no you're you're in the wrong genre man you need to you know you seem like a pretty smart guy you know you seem like a guy who values like intellectual all yeah. that stuff the most intellectual music is 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 uh, electronica like uh you know uh trance tiesto uh, I don't know Tiesto. Oh, you don't Tiesto? No. Is he big in the 2000s? Okay, but he's, Maybe. yeah, okay. yeah, like EDM, essentially, right? Electronic dance music. Electronic dance music, yeah, yeah. but with all its v- variations, you know, like okay. Goa trance to, like, happy hardcore to, like, everything, all the way to, like, Gabber. Oh, you were, you were, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, but since you're into, like, recording and stuff, so it's like, it goes by beats per minute, right? Okay. So it's like it depends if you're getting to, like, 140, you're at a certain type, like, happy hardcore. Mm-hmm. Once it gets to 180, you're like at what's called hardcore or gabber, and then you ah. get to 220, it's just like, it's noise, basically. So you're just crazy. You're just like crazy, yeah, exactly. So so what happens, it's it's kind of like I started this, you know, progression, <laughs> getting into all of this stuff, and I thought it's like, oh, it's more intellectual and stuff like that. So I get into this music, and that obviously leads me to like going to raves. So I start going into raves, uh, and then going- By the way, those at that time, they're not like what you see today. They're like in the underground, Right? Under, they're not, no, they're, I mean, were they, they? They were, yeah, there's desert raves and stuff like that. Yeah, the underground, like they're kind of outside, but they're not that much different. I, I, don't, okay. I, don't, I don't think I don't think it's changed that much, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, so I started going to raves and stuff like that, primarily for the music, but obviously there's an entire culture that comes yeah. with that. Yeah. You know, so I started hanging around with some people who are doing that, you know, doing that, and I just, I wasn't feeling comfortable because at the same time, I'm still struggling internally. I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna. I'm still not gonna drink alcohol, all right? So I'm not gonna drink alcohol, uh, not because I'm Muslim anymore, but just it's gonna impair my intellect, right? So mm. I have this idea of like, you know, I don't want to mess up my mind, right? Yeah. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be doing like, you know, a bunch of drugs or something like that, uh, mm-hmm. because that's gonna mess up my mind too. So I saw some of these guys who were like raving, like they're really messed up, <laughs> you know, because yeah. they've been even dropping, you know, uh, doing ecstasy yeah. basically. And I, I'm concerned about that because I'm like I, I I value my mind I value like computer science and like this guy can't even program anymore like, like, seriously like we because I had a, I had a oh like after he was high he he, was just, he just messed himself up Is yeah he messed himself oh long term so I, we, had, oh. we had a professor at UC okay. Irvine computer science department I'll tell you his name was Dr Klefstad okay this guy half of his class he just talk about drugs he would he would promote drugs. 
Like this, it's a weird, it's a weird guy. Basically. He's tenured, I'm sure. Yeah, he's right. definitely yeah, he's tenured. Right, he's still there. I, I checked, I looked him up recently. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Ironically, still functioning this, brain yeah, cells. This guy, this guy would just promote. He's like, you know, and there's legal ways to do it, and you could buy ephedra, you know, and it's it's like buying speed, and it's really good. It helps you program, and you know, I don't know why people talk bad about drugs. And this is like in the early 2000s, when before this whole marijuana, you know, recreational discussions going on. This guy was like, he was the coolest teacher. But he was the most ineffective teacher because he wouldn't teach us anything except about drugs, right? So he's talking to some of these students who are basically dropping at, at raves regularly. And they're like, yeah. And, and, they're, <laughs> I know, and they're like, yeah, you know, I've been doing it. And he's like, yeah, you know, but you, you got to be you got to be really careful because if you do it too much, it will mess up your memory and it, it's going to mess up your mind. And then the guy's like, yeah, you know, I think I think I can't remember things and I have this problem. He's like, oh, look like you already overdid it. You know, like, oh you know, God. you should have been careful. So I'm listening to this. And I'm like, whoa, I don't want to, you know, I, I like the music, but I don't want to end up like this guy. This guy can't even remember anything. You know, wow. this guy was like dropping like every weekend. Right. Mm hmm. Dropping meaning like taking ecstasy, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So rolling, whatever they call different. it, rolling. Yeah, yeah. roll. Yeah, rolling. rolling e, dro yeah, yeah. yeah rolling, dropping yeah. would be like LSD or something yeah, like that. Drop acid. Yeah. yeah. So drop acid. So this, you know, this. Uh, so that's kind of where I am. Is that a computer science thing? Because I knew some computer science people back in school. They're also Muslim too, mm. and you know, they drop acid and take shrooms. I don't think it's a computer science thing. I think computer science people generally uh, tend to be more isolated a little bit like stick to themselves mm -hmm. you know because they're on their computer kind of by themselves so they their the social life is a little bit less and that kind of inclines them more towards this kind of culture because it's more of an individualistic culture got it you know you're not in a rave dancing with someone else like you would be like in a nightclub right you're in a rave basically dancing by yourself primarily listening to the music got you it. may end up with someone else because you know you're high or something but it's it's more of an individualistic type thing okay yeah that that's my theory so, that makes sense yeah so so yeah i'm doing this and then uh i'm kind of i'm kind of debating back and forth between you know should i continue this something is not right with this lifestyle uh i'm becoming very materialistic so this is just an internal struggle going on it's hard to you know recon you know recollect all the thoughts that were going through my mind but there was definitely some sort of like you could say like agitation there was internal agi agitation. There was agitation i'm like is yeah this, is this what life is about you yeah. know like is 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 this you know is this what i'm supposed to be doing yeah so uh kind of those thoughts are going through sometimes i just think this is dumb the people i'm hanging out with they're making dumb jokes and i'm just laughing at it i'm like this is just this we're just being we're being dumb empty right? conversation empty conversation yeah. it's just there's no real purpose behind there's no there's no substance behind it yeah right so that's kind of getting to me and bothering me a little bit and then uh i got into street racing what street racing <laughs> so simultaneously i get into street racing basically so i know it's kind of uh, uh you're really trying to preserve your intellect <laughs> So it's, it's the company that you keep, right? So somehow yeah. the company that I was keeping, they got me into street racing, right? Okay. And uh, in a really, uh, in a very dangerous fashion, right? So like street racing on the freeway, right? Which is... A, that, that sounds which ridiculous. Is, it's ridiculous. It's really dumb and it's really dangerous. But again, it's like, it's that peer pressure, you know? Okay. So uh, I get a brand new car, Lexus IS300, like the same month it came out. It was like a really big thing. Uh, my, my parents get that for me. And, uh, you know, I start racing uh, and I'm learning, you know, what to do and this and that. So, yeah, I mean, long story short, what ends up happening is I'm racing regularly. And one day I'm, I'm, I'm investing in the stock market with money that my parents gave me. Uh, I'm just getting frustrated with school. I'm getting frustrated with this culture. And then one day I just wake up and I decide, you know what? I remember that day was a Friday morning. That day I'm just like, you know what? I'm, I'm just really, I'm just pissed off. I'm just really upset sick and tired of all of this and uh, I just want to live my own life I'm, I'm, I'm at home for that day for some reason I came back from the dorm and I wake up and I open the I open E-Trade and I look and I'm like my investment of Juniper network <laughs> that I had invested during the the, the, the dot com yeah. you know bubble it it like went down 50% okay it was like yeah. a stock market crash yeah so I was just like furious man I was just like I just lost a ton of money and I was trading on margin on top of that like the one day I trade on margin it's like I get killed yeah right? so I'm gonna get a margin call now lost all this money in the stock market I'm just really upset and then my parents are telling me my, my mom calls me like downstairs we live in a big house she calls me downstairs and she's like I want you to take out the trash 
I'm just like, oh, I, now, now like now I'm just at another level, right? I'm just like, look, my whole life I've never taken out the trash, right? Like I just we didn't really have many chores to do. So now all of a sudden she decides like on the day that the stock market crashes, somehow, <laughs> somehow I'm gonna like I'm gonna manifest my authority as a parent and tell my college age son that you need to go take out the trash. Okay, so she has a tafsir class happening at her house. So it's like the first time she's asking me to go take out the trash because all these women They're are going to come and do a tafsir class at her house. Right? So I get up and I'm like, you know what, man? Just forget this. I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, I start like, I put some clothes in my backpack. I check my accounts and everything. And I'm like, I'm running away from home. Like I'm never coming back and I'm leaving. So I, I go jump in my car you I'm, take out the trash i didn't take out the trash no <laughs> <laughs> i did i did not take out the trash <laughs> so i jump in my car and i'm like okay i'm ready to go man you know turn it on and i'm like i'm just gonna zoom out of here and done and all of a sudden i start reversing and i realize one of these aunties like park right behind my car i can't even get out so i was just like even more frustrated so i go in the middle of the tafsir class and i remember like shouting at some aunties at, at these aunties and the Quran teacher oh uh, who, who's who's uh, sister Maha who still teaches around you know oh, wow. tafsir and stuff so she's at my she's at my mom's house she's at my house basically and those aunties they come back and they remind me that we remember the day that you came and yelled at us oh, <laughs> I was no. like subhanallah you know and now they're like attending my khutbahs and they're like they're my students and stuff you know so that day I came and I yelled and I'm like you know you know, someone needs to move their car because they parked behind me, right? So one of the aunties is like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize it was behind. I'll, I'll move the car. So she goes and moves the car. I get out. I'm still frustrated. I'm upset. I just, I, I go and I start driving. And I start driving, taking the 5 South. So I'm going down and I'm just kind of like heading towards San Diego, Mexico, right? And I'm like, I'm not coming back. I'm done. No family ever again. I'm just going to be like a free, independent person. I'll do whatever I want. So I'm driving down all of a sudden. 300 ZX twin turbo comes and cuts me off and gives me the racing signal, right? Mm. And I'm just like, you know, today, you know, today <laughs> of all days, today is the day you want to do this, right? And I was driving normal. I was just, I wasn't speeding or right? I was just driving kind of normal. And all of a sudden, this guy just kind of cuts me off and just gives me the signal, right? Which is the uh, emergency lights, right? What color was the car? Do you remember? It was a white, yeah. I oh, remember. it was white? Yeah, okay. white, white 300ZX. It wasn't you, was it? No, <laughs> okay. no, no, no. I have a friend who drives a yellow one. I was like, okay, maybe okay. it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going and I'm about uh, near near Oceanside by that time. And uh, I had you're, a whole... You're a ways away. That's like an hour drive. Yeah, it's about an hour drive. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I've been going for quite a while. I'm yeah. almost there. And I'm just, I'm heading, I haven't even made a plan where I'm going to go. Either I'm going to get a hotel in San Diego or, you gonna or go I'm going to cross the border and just be in Mexico right so i'm on my way i'm like i'll figure this out later music is blasting right i got like blink 182 on and just like the the most the, the songs that kind of spur your anger you know even teenage more teenage angst to the extreme <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly you know so i'm going and i'm and all of a sudden this guy comes in and i'm just like oh man today of all days you, you really want to pull this one so i go okay fine you know so uh i i i'm like okay i accept the challenge so we start and we're going, and the thing is, the, it was stupid of me, too, because the 5 South, I, ha I just, I don't know why my brain was not working properly. 5 South doesn't mean it's going to be straight, right? There's obviously curves in freeways. So I'm just thinking 5 South, oh, all the way, it's just going to be a straight, straight drive through <laughs> So I disable traction control. Right, and I, th this is what you do when you race. I'm not going to give like racing advice yeah, or please, something please like don't. that. Please don't. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to set a bad example for other people. <laughs> Let me tell you this. In, in retrospect, never a, a, ever disable traction control. It's there for a reason, uh, and so are all the other you know things that are there. So <laughs> this is a good the other things that he disables. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it was actually raining a little bit uh, that day too. So there was, the, the streets were a little bit wet. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. definitely not smart. Definitely not smart, right? Yeah. So basically, I'm like, okay, this guy, like, I don't even care this guy i'm gonna take this guy out no matter what now if you know cars right a 300 zx twin turbo is a sports car mm -hmm. it, it's got a sport suspension it's designed to be sporty right? yeah a, an is 300 lexus is, is a luxury car it's not a sport it's car. not a sport it has a, car a strong engine but it has a strong engine but it doesn't have a sports suspension yeah it has a very uh luxury suspension it's designed to be like that so what happens it starts to wobble when you get over a certain speed 
and I won't mention what that speed is, right? So the thing is, you shouldn't be going that fast in the first place. So this day, I'm just like, you know, this this work, I'm going 100%, right? Oh, okay. This guy is, you know, this guy is going to go down, basically. And there's a bunch of traffic. So there's still traffic during that time. So I'm going, we're cutting between cars, and we're just racing and everything. And all of a sudden, it keeps on going for a while. And then it gets to a point where there's going to be this giant turn coming in. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, this guy is not going to beat me at this turn. So I try and take him at this turn. And when I go, I end up shifting like two lanes. And my car basically ends up doing a U-turn on the freeway Ooh. at a very, very fast speed, which I don't mention for like legal reasons. Right? So you lose traction in the back wheels and you spin out. Exactly. Okay. And it's really little drive, right? So you yeah. spin out. Exactly. Yeah. So I spin out. I hit the center divider and I hit like three other cars. Oh, my God. Okay. So, so yeah. So that and so that incident that happened kind of kind of got me to a point where um, I started thinking about, you know, what's going to happen. So what really bothered me was not so much the accident. What bothered me was two things. Number one, I walked out of there and I didn't have a scratch on me. Mm. So people came and started telling me, you know, some of those aunties, they used to come and they're like, you know what, Allah, you know, Allah saved you, son. Allah saved you. I'm like, you know, I don't even believe in Allah, man. What are you talking about? You know, so I'm telling you Allah has saved you for a reason and there's a purpose and this and that. I'm like, you know, I don't really believe in that stuff. But you just got kind of, lucky. It just, yeah, exactly. But it kind, yeah. of, it kind of stayed in the back of my mind, mm-hmm. right? Is that, you know, going that fast, there was an aspect of, you know, you know, I, I got really, really lucky. Yeah. I got saved. So what ends up happening, I kind of pretend like I'm injured, okay? Because ambulance came, this and that, and I'm like, I realize I'm in big trouble. So mm. you, you don't want to be caught racing. You don't you don't want to be, I don't want to be caught racing. So you I, can get charged with manslaughter in California. That's what, was, hap- that's what was happening, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. police shows up, and I'm getting mm. scared. So I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, my back is hurting and this and that. So I end up going to the uh, emergency room. And I'm like, they're like, yeah, they did some x-rays and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm actually perfectly fine. Nothing is wrong with me. But I was just like, I don't know how to process this. I need to think about what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, my whole plan of running away from home is destroyed. Like, everything is destroyed. My car is destroyed. Everything is, is, is going to be messed up now. So this police officer comes, and he goes, I know how fast you were going. I have witness reports that say you were going, you know, X amount of miles per hour. Right? And... And I'm like, no, that's ridiculous. You know, that's, that's not true. And actually, it was true. But I'm like, no, that's not true. And he's like, look, I know you, you punk. He's like, look at a teenager, punk kid. Like, you kid, I'm going to make sure you go to jail. Like, I'm going to make sure that they press charges and you're going to jail because you should not be on the street. So that's when I get released. I go home and I'm just like, if I go to jail. Life's over. Life's over, right? I was like 19 or something, 19 or 20. Yeah. So for me, this is like everything's over no more raves no, no more no, no more intellectual music no more intellectual music no more i mean everything going through my mind all the movies i've watched well what if i drop the soap what's gonna what's gonna happen oh to me God. like every, you, can, you can imagine everything is going through my mind right now and i'm just like i'm done like i'm i'm finished i don't even know what this means this is life in prison like what does this mean so, uh, and he said, yeah, this is attempted manslaughter. You're going to jail. I'll make yeah. sure that you have charges pressed against Thank you. goodness he didn't clock you. Like, yeah. Well, you know, well, if he had, you know. Well, like, he wasn't there. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. there. So that's what I'm just like, you know, when he said, yeah, I know how fast you're going. I'm like, how no. could you possibly know? But Scaring the, you. The irony was the number he put was exactly the number I was going, right? Wow. So I was just like, how in the world did this guy figure it out? So he figured out basically probably what the maximum speed was with the speed limitation on the car and figured out how fast you can go. Mm. So maybe that's how he got it, but he got pretty You just cool. gave away how fast you were going. I did, I did. But <laughs> hey, that's only if somebody goes and looks up looks up how, how yeah. I'm a rewind what, what model was it <laughs> yeah, check okay. the model now okay. it's, you know, it's digital speed at least I didn't uh, Sheikh was it. fast I was about to remove the digital speed um, uh, limit as well you can do is, that you can do that and you oh. can hack it you know computer science but uh, <laughs> but you don't want to do that <laughs> that's very very dangerous that's even more dangerous I bought the engine you know? uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah that too so <laughs> anyway so then I'm sitting there in my room and I'm just like what am I going to do that's what started changing me so I'm like nobody can get me out of the situation my dad, no matter how much money he spends, he can't help me. My mom can't help me. None of my friends. I, I, there's nobody there for me. So that's when I just decided, you know what? I'm, I'm done. The only option I have left pray to God. is to pray to God. That's it. So I made a dua, and I'm just like, you know what? Okay, God, I don't even know if you exist. But, you know, if you do, uh, like, help me. And I, I basically said, I said, if you get me out of this situation, 
then I promise I will, and I remember this very clearly, I, I was very cautious, very skeptical. I'm like, <laughs> I, I promise you that I will at least put in a real effort to search for whether you exist or not. Wow. Like that was my- That is that the most like, minimum. <laughs> <laughs> that was like my conditional draw. Like, you know, and I, I really promise that if you help me with this, I will, I will really put in effort to, to figure out if this is true or not true, if you're, if you're real or not real. Right, so that was, that was my job. It wasn't real. <laughs> no, but 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 the irony was that's what oh. changed that changed my life, right? Wow. Because when I found out that there's no charges against me, nothing happened at all. They just insurance. Came it just through insurance. And I, I didn't even know. I, mean, I was a spoiled kid, right? So my parents are paying the insurance. I don't even know what that looks like. Yeah, I got a point or two points or something like that. I had to go to traffic school or something like that. No one pressed charges. People no got one over pressed it. charges. Not nothing. Everything else was fine, right? So after I realized that that's what happened, I was just like, "This is." I didn't say Alhamdulillah, but I was just like, "This is excellent. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is this is the best thing that could ever happen." And now. I have this internal struggle about, you know what? I made a promise. Yeah. I made a promise. Was this promise just like a state of weakness that, you know, people mm. who are religious, they just make when they get emotional and stuff. Just like the Quran says about when you're on the boat and, you know, people, they, yeah. even the idol worshippers, they call out to Allah. So, like, I think I might have encountered that story at some point or the same mentality comes in. It's like, you know what? Did I just make that promise in a, in a, set, in a state of weakness? Uh, emotional weakness because I didn't know what else to do or did I actually make that as a real promise so this is internal de like debate comes into me I'm thinking like you know what is it a real promise or is it not a real promise and then I start analyzing and I'm like you know what? what what kind of person am I if either I'm an extremely weak person that I just give in to the emotion I, I hope I consider myself to be intellectually strong person uh, I, I hope to be right versus what you know if I'm making promise I'm just gonna keep breaking them what kind of integrity is that? So that's yeah. that's that's an internal debate, and I'm like, you know, no, I'm like, you know, what? no. I analyzed it. No, that was a real sincere reaction that I had, and I meant what I said, and I should stick with what I'm saying. So that was my decision. That changed my life. I said I'm gonna stick with what I'm saying, and I'm gonna start searching. Now I don't know what where to search. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to ask. I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. So all I do was I I go to the UCI library, and I say, you know what? I'm gonna, st and I wasn't looking into Islam at this time. I was only looking into God. So God, okay. God specifically, just whether there's a creator or not. So I go into the philosophy section again, the same section that got me away from Islam in the first place, and I start going and reading books on God. You know, like with like kalam, cosmological argument, uh, or not even there. No, yet. no, like no Christian not arguments, just, kind of things. Christian argument, just like just any books I can find on yeah. God. So yeah, okay. most of them come up are Christian arguments. Uh, and, I, and I start going and reading the atheist arguments. So what I start doing is I start reading the atheist arguments saying, hey, can I, can I see the weakness in any of these arguments mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. And then I start reading the response to them eventually, and I start comparing the two, right? And that's kind of, that is the road that kind of brought me on the direction back towards Islam. So it was reading those arguments, actually. It and you reading, were like, oh, this is actually, they have a say. They, have, they have a weighty ex argument. Exactly. It's reading mm. the arguments that kind of first brought me back. And that was the first step. And then I started reading uh, other ones. So some arguments didn't make sense. And again, I'm, I'm like 19 or 20. So philosophy was, it's, I'm not a philosophy major. And I think a at that time, a lot of the, the, the so-called big four, I don't think were the big four. Back, like oh, these Haw neo atheists and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah Hawkins yeah. Da and Doc Dawkins. Dawkins or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Dawkins yeah. and uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking, Stephen Dawkins. Hawking. Uh, What's his name? He's the biggest one out of them now. Uh, <coughs> the most famous one. He's the only one around that's left. Yeah. Krauss and other ones. I don't remember. No, Krauss is a uh, Bill Maher. And no, the other. Uh, you know who I'm talking the about. The guy right? who comes on Neil Joe DeGrasse. Rogan. Show Joe Rogan. Regularly. Joe Rogan loves him. You know? He he had a debate with Neil Joe with Peterson. He had yeah, Daniel you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's I at know. the point now where he believes that we don't have free will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I forget, I just, name I forget his name because right he's useless. Hitchens, he died no, though. no, Christopher Hitchens died. He was another yeah. one. He yeah. was one of Hitchens the big four. And this is the last guy. Uh, he's like very... He's very of, arrogant. He's arrogant, but he's Daniel like soft-spoken. Hold on. I'm just going to look it up. I'm just going to look it up. All right, Shay, while he's looking that up, I want to go back because, you know, it's very... It's a story, but there's a lesson behind it. And Sam Harris. Wait, Sam Harris. Oh, thank God. you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. May Allah guide him. All right. Um, uh, um, the I want to go back to a point that you made, and I think this is important for people who are dealing with skepticism. They're dealing with this loss of identity and faith. 
and you, you had a part in your story, which I think is very common theme. I see in a lot of these kind of, I left this time, came back to this time story is at some point, some person didn't believe in God sits there and makes a dot. Mm. They make a prayer to God and they say, God, if you exist X, Y, Z. And what's amazing. I think your story, what's funny is how much setup there was, I you know divine setup. We can call it or whatever it is right. for a sincere prayer. And I, and I've told some students and I've told some kids, like, look, if you're, cause you don't know the state of the people in your crowd, right? You think, okay, you're at a Muslim event. You must be Muslim. I'm going to assume you're doing fine. But hypothetically, mm-hmm. you're not doing well. Your, your faith is kind of shaky. Are you think, is this real? Is this real? I'm living in the U S things are falling apart around me. I've told some students that look at, if you're really, you're doubting anything, wake up 3 a.m. No one's going to know you woke up at 3 a.m. Go throw some cold water on your face. Don't mm. make you know, you know what the is? Just throw some cold water on your face. Because I want this to be as sincere as possible. Go put your head on the ground and say, God, if you exist, X, Y, Z. Fight, help me, guide me. If not, don't guide me. Because let's say he doesn't guide you. Mm. This is a sincere drive. No one's ever going to know you made this prayer. Right. You woke up in the middle of the night. There's like so many factors that this is as sincere as you're ever going to get in your life. Yep. If he doesn't answer you hypothetically, yep. you can have a case against him on the day of judgment. Allah, I made dua. You didn't answer me for your, I wanted guidance. Right. No one's gonna have a case yeah. against the law on the day of judgment, yeah, right? So that's that. that's the point. Right. <laughs> and if you ask it sincerely, he will guide you. Yep. Right. So I think that's uh, something to pull out of this story. Absolutely. It's not just for entertainment value, but you, know, you made a draw, and uh, these draws aren't they're not for free. They're, you don't just say things, right, and say like, oh, does he exist? Not exist? Like when you when you ask something sincerely, it's gonna be answered. Exactly. If it's you know if it's best for you, especially for guidance, and that's answered. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's a good point. You got Sam Harris. Yeah, you figured it out already. Oh yeah, Sam Harris. Yeah, we got Sam Harris. <laughs> Uh, where were we before the that? So that led about me the, to he's looking at the God two arguments. Oh, yeah, the God philosophy. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. And those the 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 current day arguments are very. Uh, I would say they're not as sophisticated as yeah. the older. Yeah, they're, they're, stuff. they're 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 not. You yeah, know? Uh, they have a lot more like data, uh, quote unquote, like scientific data and stuff yeah. that they're using. They use a lot more rhetoric because again, these sophistry. You know, they use sophistry yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's more for public consumption mm-hmm. than it is as an actual intellectual argument. A, lo- a lot of these people who follow these guys are now feeling empty, yeah. and that's why Sam Harris has to put out books on like the importance of meditation, exactly, and reflection, exactly. And you're just like, this is pretty much this is religion. This is a new yeah. religion circle. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's why when Jordan Peterson comes around, they all flock to him. Like what? <laughs> He's so smart. He's religious. Yada yada yada. So that's, yep. but you know, you had to kind of find that on your own, just yep. which is very. Uh, I mean, so after that, you kind of go towards Islam, right? You yes. kind of you you your inclination is now okay. It, it gets something, there. Yeah, it's, it's still a long process, but yeah, it gets yeah. there. That eventually. that's the starting point, right? Yeah. So wh- where where does that put you next? Do you start praying? Do you start having trying to hang out with the MSA, or is this still like an offshoot? Oh, like, immediately after. Yeah, I'm saying like, what what comes next? You know, what like, comes what's... next basically is you know once I get to the point of okay believing okay there's a good case for the existence of God, I start searching into other religions, particularly religions. Oh, so you're not even you're not even on the Islam path. No, yet. no, I'm not on the Islam path. You're yet. just God exists. God exists. That's it. That's oh, it. perennialist so, brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Almost there, almost there, yeah. Divine so, wisdom, divine. eternal wisdom, eternal wisdom. Eternal, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm almost, I'm looking into all the other religions as well. And um, again, like every religion or just like the... Every the, religion that I can I can come across. You know, I remember when I was in high school, I went to, for a debate competition in England. And uh, for some reason, I, we went to a bookshop and I just had this fascination with religion during that period of time. So I bought a dictionary of religions. And I still had that book with me. So I opened that book and I start going through basically every single religion in existence about kind of what, you know, what do they basically teach or what do they believe? Now, it was a, it was a not a very deep analysis, but mm-hmm. it's looking at all these, uh, you know, uh, animist religions and stuff like that in different parts of the world. It says kind of what population uh, are, are the people, how many are there, and kind of what are their, some of their basic beliefs. So I'm just going through the list and I'm just like, oh. They believe in like shamans and stuff like that. I'm like, I crossed that one off. <laughs> they crossed that one off. So the vast majority, of the, there's like, I don't know, there's like 5,000 religions or something in there. I'm just going through and I'm like, if something's really, really small, I'm like, yeah, probably you can just cross that one off. <laughs> you know, just going through and kind of understanding all of these. And most of them, I'm like, you know, th- this is why I became atheist in the first place. Like all of these things, something is wrong with, with yeah. a lot of these religions, you know? I think that's what, one of the reasons why a lot of people become very skeptical is they're like, oh, well, there's so many bad religions out there. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that doesn't mean that there isn't one 
right one though. There's also a lot of bad science, but you still there's a lot of bad. I you mean, still there, believe to be living science. So there's a lot of bad cars out there. But you yeah. still, you know, there's a good car out <laughs> exactly. there as well. Like there's there's bad everything out there. You yeah. know, so so that's uh, I I start doing that. And then I go back to the library, and uh, my library is pretty much my only reference because I don't have anyone to talk to that I kind of respect. On the intellectually, front. intellectually, like, that you yeah. know, I don't have a family member I can go and talk to and be like, oh, you know. I remember one time one of my uncles, he came. He's not very practicing, but he kind of started debating me. He's like, you know, why? Back when I was when I was still Muslim, like in high yeah. school, and he's like, you reject hadith. My my dad called him over. He's like, you know. This guy doesn't even believe in hadith. He's like, oh, I'm going to convince him. Don't worry. So this guy's trying to convince me to like, you know, believe in hadith. And I'm just seeing like the arguments are not very strong. And I'm just like, you know, I'm debating back and forth with him. So I don't really have anyone I can go to, yeah. like to talk to. Going to like khutbahs growing up, the khutbahs that I went to, like, you know. For weak all, sauce, yeah. This is... they're, they're extremely boring, okay. Like they didn't appeal to me, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. With all due respect to the khatib, uh, they weren't relevant to me. And... You know, in all honesty, we used to probably go five, ten minutes before the salat begins anyway. So we're not even getting most of the khutbah. If you ask me what, what khutbah do I remember for the first, you know, uh, 19 years of my life, the only one statement I remember during one khutbah was something that made me laugh. It's basically me and my brother were sitting there. We're outside. And the khatib goes, you know what? And it's, it's, a, it's a sunnah to take a shower at least once a week. You know, at least on Friday, you should take a shower. <laughs> We're just looking at each other like, oh man, this is gross. <laughs> like, you know, what the heck? Is that why some of these people smell bad? <laughs> you know, that's the only thing I remember from any khutbah like, before the age of 19. Like, I can't remember a single thing besides that, right? So that's that's kind of my background. So I think he meant to say ghusl, right? That, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he meant ghusl, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's like, at least once a week. And we're just like, Whoa, These people like, don't shower. Like, what's going on here? You know? So so that's that's my recollection. So who am I going to go to? I'm not going to go to that imam. I'm not going to go to my local imam. I'm not going to go to anyone, right? So yeah. I don't have any connection with any person. I can I, I feel comfortable yeah. asking religious questions to. So eventually. You know, uh, I tell my dad, you know, I'm, he didn't know anything that was happening. But I tell him, like, you know, I'm kind of interested. I might join you for, you know, a Friday prayer or something like that. So I'm just reading by myself in the library. But then I'm like, you know, maybe I should go and attend this Friday prayer thing again. I should start this up again. So I start attending Friday prayer. And uh, one of the people who was giving the khutbah, he was, uh, he was kind of like a guy. He's like, he's the son of an imam. Uh, he, those of you who know Molana Metter, he's a Cypress Masjid old old time Imam. His son was basically Cal State Fullerton doing his master's degree business management, and he used to read up on philosophy too. So one day, I'm just like sitting in the khutbah and I'm listening to him, and he mentioned something about like like something intellectual. Ooh. And I was just like, oh, this guy's like, this guy's kind of smart. Like this is this is not normal. Like a, mm -hmm. it's like a like a Muslim guy, and he's giving the khutbah and he's. It's kind of like intellectual. He, he mentioned something, so I'm like, this is interesting. So I told my dad, I'm like, you know, I want to, you know, like, just talk to this guy for a few minutes afterwards. So I used to go and just ask him very superficial questions just to, to test him, to see ah, him. I was kind of, I wouldn't ask him the deep question. I was asking him something a little bit more superficial and just kind of like, I'm like, I just want to stand next to you while you're talking to other people just to see what you're saying. Hmm. So people would ask him questions, you know, how long should your beard be? And you know, he would answer fit questions and this and that. And uh, <clears throat> one day, I'm just sitting there listening to him. Hmm. And he mentioned something about, uh, he goes, someone asked him something about uh, philosophy or, or something about philosophy. Okay. And then he goes, you know, oh, Imam Ghazali, he refuted the philosophers. I'm just oh. like, whoa, philosophers? refute that sounds interesting like what's this who's this ghazali guy like you know and he's like yeah yeah imam ghazali he wrote this book against the philosophers you know responding to their arguments i'm like what kind of argument arguments about like god and stuff like that too he goes yeah he responded to all that too i'm like whoa what there's like a, a muslim guy there's like a do? muslim imam guy from like hundreds of years ago who like wrote this stuff and he's like yeah yeah this is that there's a book there but but you shouldn't read it I'm like, why not? He's like, no, no, it's a very advanced book. It's not a book you should read. So for me, I'm just like, I'm kind of that person. Someone's like, you know what? No, you can't do it. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, I'm, I'm going to do it then. I'm going to do the exact opposite. So he's like, no, no, it's way beyond your level. You shouldn't do it. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I go online. 
Amazon was just like picking up at that time. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? Okay, I got the name Ghazali. I'm gonna look this guy up. So I go and buy this guy's books. I buy all the books that I can find from him. And then Amazon had the recommendations. So the moment you buy this, it gives you recommendation on the same topic. So I'm yeah. Like, I'm like, that looks really interesting. So there's another book. So I, wrote, I bought Ihya al uh Revival of the Re- Religious yeah. Sciences. Then I, I see this uh, other recommendation. It's uh, Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam by Muhammad Iqbal. It's like a philosophy book as well. So I look at that, I'm like, that's interesting. That's a modern. Is it's, that mo- it's modern. ITS, right? Islamic. Uh, uh, I don't know if ITS published it, but it's uh, they, this this one was uh, published in, in Pakistan or something. Oh, like okay, that. okay. Because yeah. that name sounds very familiar. Muhammad yeah. Iqbal is the he's the intellectual founder of Pakistan. He's a oh, very, that, very, oh, very I important. Feel, oh, okay. Yeah, he's, I, he's, I'm he's, gonna edit that out. I feel yeah. very, I feel very ignorant now. <laughs> no, he, <he's> a, <laughs> it's okay. Not everyone. Yeah. He's, he's Sorry, a, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. He's a poet. He's a poet philosopher. Basically, uh-huh. so he he this is a guy who's very educated. Okay. His field is philosophy too. I mean, he's he's considered to be a very um, very advanced in that field. So anyway, I buy his book, and I get it, and I just open the beginning, and he's talking about like Immanuel Kant, and he's talking about like you know Kant refuted Aristotle, and I'm just like, whoa, this, this is, is this is some interesting stuff. This is right up your alley at this Ex- point. Exactly. So yeah. I'm just like, this is. So that what what it did was it introduced me to this idea that hey there's actually some smart Muslims that exist because my experience and my understanding was Muslims are just a bunch of anti-intellectual people and that automatically reflects on the religion Islam is like anti-intellectual something's going on here and now when I get exposed to like thinkers like Ghazali thinkers like Muhammad Iqbal then I'm just like and, and then he also recommended this other Imam he recommended uh, Sheikh Abdul Hassan Al Nadwi some of his books mm-hmm. so I started reading this I'm like oh, this guy like this guy actually seems like pretty intelligent he seems to know what he's talking about and the reality is I never read any books on Islam like prior to this <laughs> so I, I can't even I, I'm not even I'm not even supposed to make this judgment I had not actually read any books at all in, in, in my I, honestly before it's just your preconceived notion of what they would be if you had read them exactly I had never actually read an entire book I think in my entire life um, before before college so like my entire, even the books we're supposed to read in high school, oh, like yeah. I just read the cliff notes. You know? yeah, yeah, like yeah, not, yeah. I didn't even read the whole cliff note because that would take a lot of effort too. So I just, but I still got A's in classes, right? So that's the problem with our school system. But I had not read any of these books. I was not a reader, right? I read comic books, but I don't read actual books. C- Catcher in the Rye. Uh, didn't read that. Uh, did, I read the cliff notes on it, the, right? Cliff, what was the a other Prayer one? for Owen Meany. I read, you know, Little Women. Lord of the Flies. Uh, Lord, Lord of the, the Flies. Pride, Pride and Prejudice. Pride yeah. and Prejudice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, Sheikh, this is a good... Uh, I want to summarize another point that I think a lot of people miss, especially young people, because they're not exposed to it, just like you. They don't think Islam has had very deep thinkers that yeah. thought of ev- all the questions you've ever had, all the questions someone might have. Yeah. It blows people's mind sometimes that someone a thousand years ago actually already thought about this and answered it. Not just answered it, such a good answer. Like the question is done and dead if you just knew where to look. Yep. So I think that's something people who are dealing with these doubts and skepticism, just because you haven't seen an answer to it doesn't mean someone in the Islamic history didn't already answer it. I mean, it's 1400 years later. Do you really think you have a philosophical question that was not addressed? Right. And so, well, see, the problem, the root cause of the problem is we are taught in our society that we're the most advanced people, right? In terms yep. of technology, we are. Yep. Yep. But we're the most advanced people. We're the most intelligent people. Maternity. And yep. we look back at everything else, the med- medieval ages, the dark ages. These people don't understand anything about the world. They're just a bunch of people who believe the earth is flat. They don't know, you know, the, just they don't know what electricity is. Therefore, they don't know anything about the world. So if that's the assumption, why would I grow up thinking that... Yep they would have answered something for me that's relevant for the first 1300 years you know in yeah. Islam and, and that's the what's amazing is modernity is the opposite of Islamic thought in that regard exactly modernity says today's the best Islam says Prophet generation Allah was the best generation no one after that no one after that exactly. and it only gets worse exactly. <laughs> the further away from you know prophethood you get yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. and I think that has to do with what you're learning in public school what yeah. what you um, what they teach there? It's because you know you kind of like if, when you learn about world history, mm. you learn about you know Mesopotamia. That's where civilization started. Then you get into like Greece, Rome, and then uh, after that, that's like you know the height of thought at the time. Then you just have go to the next white nation. Yeah, <laughs> you know you have death, the medieval period, the the plague, whatever. But during this time, all the yeah. Europe is essentially dark. You have 
you know, the whole, uh, you know, the Muslim region, that's, you know, that's, that's lit up, right? There's intellectual stuff going on. It's, it's great. But none of that stuff is covered. Nope. Yeah. No. And when then, you say medieval scholar in Islam, that's actually, that's probably a big shot when you say medieval. Exactly. Because that's a time period. Yeah, not, yeah, not exactly. a, as, you know, Sheikh Asghar got in trouble, I guess, for using the word medieval for a scholar, right? Oh, right. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Because they understand that it's a time period. Right. But, yeah. But it has a for negative connotation. Negative connotation today. Negative but connotation. for us, it's like, yeah, he was an amazing guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't until the, the Enlightenment then everything turned around. And exactly. It's thought and right. science, and that, I, that's, I think that that has to. Uh, and, exa- and I think our school system has changed a little bit. So they, they incorporate like a week or two of like, hey, there is stuff going on in the rest of the world. <laughs> you know, but again, that doesn't balance the narrative. The Silk Road uh, papyrus gunpowder. <laughs> someone, someone made paper somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We'll throw in the, we'll throw in the Chinese. That's, that's you know, so get a word. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, your philosophy class, I mean, this is, when you name all the philosophers you can name. How many of them are not white? Exactly. I mean, you're exactly. gonna tell me there's no other philosophers. Where are all the Indian philosophers, the Chinese philosophers, the Muslim philosophers? They're missing. They're yeah, missing. Exactly. Until today, there's there's they're still yeah. missing. African they're not, philosophers. They're not re- they're not relevant because they weren't seen in that Western philosophy tradition. So some yeah. of them, what they'll do is they'll define this is the Western or European philosophical tradition. Yeah, it, they, it's yeah. now Judeo-Christian. Or that, ju- that's the that's that's the, another term that they use. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the more uh, conservative but, right but term the, now. But the problem is that every time you know science is being presented, any subject is being presented, it's it's being presented as if we are people who are connected now with the rest of the world. Therefore, when we present something, it is an objective, universal view of the entire world. Mm-hmm. But it's not. It's not, and it's not defined that way, and that's a huge problem huge problem got it definitely so you eventually make your way back to islam eventually you, get back to islam yes. you find you you'd probably make your you know get your list down a few religions and then you end back at square one right that's yes. uh yeah exactly. okay exactly but a different appreciation and understanding of islam right? because you, you get to it yourself now i get to it myself and also yeah I, to do this by the way people are like well how do you do this in your spare time i dropped out of school actually so, oh, yeah, so I, I, I dropped out of school. You stopped the comp sci thing. I, I stopped the comp sci. What happens in UCI? I was about to. I was, I'm like, I'm done with school. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't need a university education. I need to figure this out for my life first. But what happened when I went to the office? I was like, I'm dropping out. The lady's <laughs> like, Well, here's my suggestion. You know, you can just put your uh, admission on hold for up to one year, and if you change your mind 11 and a half months later, you can automatically enroll without having to re-register. So I'm like, yeah, all right, that's fine. What I I, already, I know I'm not coming back, but you know, just in case. This in case, go ahead, go ahead and do that, whatever that is. Yeah. Make my parents happy. They're like, oh, good. He's got 12 months to do whatever the heck he wants, you know. So I do that. So in that period, I'm sitting there reading, studying, going, reading, you know, these books, talking, start talking to a few people that I can talk to. Pretty much only this one guy who you know I kind of have some confidence in. And it brings me eventually kind of back towards Islam to the point where I'm like, yeah, I want to be Muslim now. I identify as Muslim identify didn't, oh, have the, didn't have the terminology back then uh, right uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we're getting into the but uh yeah i'm Please. muslim now <laughs> but i still have a ton of questions and okay. and i and i want those questions resolved and i want answers to them so i need to study islam more in depth so that's kind of where mm. where i was you mm-hmm. know so i may i tell my parents i'm like look i need to go study islam and uh because the books that i got was uh, by sheikh abul hassan nadwi I'm like, well, I've looked around, and the only place I can really learn Islam is in India at the school Nadwa. Like, mm. this is where I need to go. My parents are like, yeah, right. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna go to India. Yeah, there, there's over our dead bodies that you're gonna, we're gonna let you go to India. It's not gonna happen. Mm-hmm. So uh, they sent me to like these local Islamic schools over here, and just horrible experience. You know, if you want me to get into it, I can get into it. But. Yeah, say some stuff. So I mean, at the time, there's no IOK. No, there's, there's no, no CIU. There's. There, there, so yeah, I don't even are. know about IOK, right? I, look, I, I think I, IOK was happening in like someone's house. Yeah, yeah it, it was, it was. Right, yeah, that's... Yeah. So what was happening is basically, again, I'm at a point where I'm still not associating with any Muslims. Okay? Oh. I'm, I still don't have any Muslim friends. Your network is very... My, there's yeah. no network. I'm not part of MSA. I'm not part of anything. So I'm just kind of doing this on the side. Uh, and then yeah. when I kind of become Muslim, I'm still going to the library, <clears> even though I'm not enrolled in UCI. I'm going to UCI every single day. And I'm sitting in the library and I'm reading. So I'm like, well, now that I'm Muslim, I want to start praying. Okay, well, technically, I'm supposed to be praying in a group. Okay, I found these Muslims who are praying on campus. So I, the way I joined MSA, quote unquote, was just by praying with them. So I take a break, I go and pray with them, and then I leave. And they're like, you know, you should stay. I'm like, no, I got a lot of reading to do, and you know, <laughs> I would leave. Uh, so that was like my experience at the, at the time. And then I tell my parents, I'm like, you know, I need to go to this Islamic school. 
I need to go and like continue learning this thing. It's really important for me. And they're like, no, you're not gonna travel to like a random country like India. Like we, we fled that country to come to America for the American dream and you're going back to the place where we ran away from? Like this makes no sense at all. Mm-hmm. It's never gonna happen. This is, this is the, the dumbest idea we've ever heard. Like from their perspective, like this makes no sense. People are dying to come to America and you're like trying to die to go back mm-hmm. to where we, where we fled from in the first place. It doesn't make sense. So they said, no, you're not doing that, but we talked to some random people for you. And we found out that there's an Islamic school in San Diego. So you go in that school in San Diego and you're gonna get the exact same thing. So I'm thinking, okay, well, what is it? It's a madrasa, right? So I'm like, I don't even know what a madrasa is, but the only thing that I've read was, I'm reading the books of Imam Ghazali. I'm like, well, Imam Ghazali was teaching at Madrasa Nizamiya, right? So I'm like, oh, well, it's one of those madrasa. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have like, a bunch of Imam Ghazali as my teacher. So I can, this is gonna be awesome. I'm gonna like discuss like these deep philosophical, aqidah, theological discussions with them. This is gonna be great. I'm, I'm ready, sign me up. So my parents are like, okay, great. You know, we're, we're, we're very happy. You know, we know about the madrasa system. I'm like, yeah, I, I had no idea that you even knew about this, you know? Yeah. Like you you've knew been, about- You've been like, holding this back you, from me. Exactly, you've been holding <laughs> this back. Like I never even heard of like madrasa nizamiya. This is gonna be like one of those things I didn't even know. They're like, yo, we know about madrasas, of course we know about madrasas, you know? So I'm just like, oh man. This is great. <laughs> so I, 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 they, they're like, you're sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. I go to San Diego, pack up my bags, everything, go in there, live inside the masjid in oh. San Diego, okay? So with the tablighi masjid. So I go there. And the first thing, right, the first thing I go in, I meet the principal of the school and he's like Tablighi guy, you know, full beard and stuff. And I'm like, this guy like must be one of the Imam Ghazali type guys. You know, this, is, this is pretty cool. I can ask him questions and stuff. So he's just telling me what school is going to be like. So he, he hears my, he hears what's going on. And my dad tells him, you know, he dropped out of UCI and this and that. She's like, no, you know, son, this is, this is very bad. You should go back into UCI and you should finish your computer science degree. Just like what? Like what? Wait a minute. Like, dude, I just came from atheism, right? Mm-hmm. I'm coming to an Islamic school to like learn about Islam, and you're telling me I should go back to school, like to do my career. Like something, something's not clicking. So like, yeah. something is just not feeling right. I'm not understanding what's going on. And then he's like, okay, I tell you what, if you're gonna come and enroll in our school, at least part time, go to like community college and do a profession because it's really important to be balanced. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like being, I don't understand what this whole being balanced means. Cause I'm coming from a very like secular perspective here. Yeah. 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 So I'm coming in and they're like, okay, well, so, but the guy thinks, okay, fine. You, you're, Someone has to pay for the operation. That's, that's, yeah, that's exactly, what he's telling you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So he comes in and, uh, you know, I come in, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to, I want to do the Islamic program. I don't even know what that is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do the Islamic program. They're like, oh, good. We're, we're just launching a new cohort. It's going to be perfect. We have this other teacher who just came from Pakistan. He's so interesting. He's like a, he's like a Thailandy guy. He's a convert to Islam. He studied in Pakistan. Uh, he speaks Urdu, speaks Arabic. And I'm like, I don't want to care about the Urdu, but yeah, okay, the Arabic, that's, <laughs> that's, that's good. He knows Arabic, that's important. So he goes, okay, you're, you're going to really enjoy him. I'm like, okay, this is good. So we're living on campus. First of all, classes start one week late. So I'm like, you know, Wait a minute, punctuality, Islam. I was reading about like some punctuality stuff and okay, that's not happening. So I'm kind of getting disappointed. Then these students, these are like, these are like, uh, forget high school dropout. These are like middle school dropout kids who are put in the madrasa, okay? They're memorizing Quran. They have like mm-hmm. very little education. They're not there for studying Islam. They're not serious at all. Um, and then I find out, you know, I, I go into the bathroom, okay? The bathroom, it, again, I'm coming from like uh, upper middle class, you know, standards so i go into the bathroom and oh, the it's the it's the hole in the wall toilet and above it is the shower and so everything is wet right every, it's just everything is wet <laughs> dirty just disgusting you know and i'm just like okay i'm gonna have to shower right. on top of the toilet right so i'm gonna do both so i'm like i was just like okay this is very difficult it's dirty uh something's not feeling right i'm like you know what it's okay man if I can get the answers to my questions, this is worth it, you know? So I put up with all that, class begins. Class was just, it was, it was miserable. Uh, it was, 
Arabic grammar. Right? This is why people are like, you know, why don't you teach Arabic grammar in the beginning? I'm like, Chris, understand where I'm coming from. I'm trying to learn Islam. I'm not trying to learn Arabic grammar. You don't want so, to drop out early. Exactly. You drop out early is what's going to happen. So I'm, I'm studying Arabic grammar, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I am translating uh, for the guy, into because the guy doesn't speak English. So I'm like translating... He only speaks two languages. So you... he, speaks, he speaks Arabic and Urdu. That's, that's it. That's right. Thailand or whatever, yeah, yeah, Cambodian yeah. or something, whatever it was. So I'm. He's like, well, since you seem to be kind of the smart, like te most intelligent kids in the class, you're gonna somehow translate what I'm saying to the rest of the kids so that they can understand what's going on. It was like this translation thing. We're trying to learn Arabic grammar, and then we're going and learning a, a book called Beishti Zewar, which is like a, a fiqh book on Islamic law, basic Hanafi fiqh book. So for me, I'm like, I, I didn't even know I'm going into like a Islamic law program. Okay, I'm going in there to learn Islam, whatever that means. So I, I'm exposed to, okay, well, you know, if uh, if you have a mouse and the mouse falls into your jar of clarified butter, how much of the butter do you have to scoop out before that butter is considered pure? And I'm just looking at this, like, what the hell is this? Like, what is this? And then if a donkey falls into a well, yeah. right, how much of the water do you have to scoop out before your wudu will be valid? And we're sitting there the whole, like, the whole month we're sitting there and I'm just like these are the this ain't, this, this, this ain't Imam Ghazali man like is this and, and you know I, I, I don't know yeah, Imam Ghazali wrote about this stuff too he's got fit books addressing all these issues but again I, I don't have a, a, a conceptual view, yeah. a holistic yeah. view of this thing and I'm not coming in there for this reason then when I find out the majority of the students in class the majority of my classmates during break time, they're always leaving and they're going in the back and I don't know what they're doing. I find out that they're smoking weed in the back. Oh, this is so, great. so I'm just like, okay, man. So Been there, done that. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just like, what is it? First of all, none of these guys want to be here. Okay? Yeah. None of them are very educated. They're definitely not intellectual. And then they're out in the back smoking weed. Like, is this, is this what I like left mm -hmm. everything behind yeah. for? So I'm very, very disappointed. So I'm like, I want to get out of here. So uh, my parents find out, they're like, oh, well, you know, we have some inside information. One of the teachers who used to be in San Diego, he knew there were problems in San Diego. So he actually started his own school in Cerritos. So you can transfer into his school and you are not going to have any of these problems. I'm like, okay, great. So let's do that. So I transfer over to his school. It turns out to be ex-military. Uh, you know, he's very, like, just a very rough style. He's a nice guy and all that, you know, deep down. But so I go into his school and we start studying the same thing. It's again, it's it's Arabic grammar primarily and it's it's Islamic law. That's the madrasa system. That's the madrasa system. But again, yeah. but I'm you, thinking... You just think madrasa... Madrasa is Islamia. Madrasa. Yeah. This yeah. Is, you know, this is yeah. mid, middle age, height, golden period of Islam where people are getting this comprehensive, awesome education and all that. So I'm going in there and I'm studying this stuff. And the same problem happens, right? F living, you know, in the facilities. I was driving back and forth, but people are living on campus in the masjid, basically. None of these students want to be there, right? Yeah. Some, of, you know, I still know some of my classmates. None of them want to be there. Um, they're not serious. They're not doing their homework. And what I'm studying is not what, what I originally came for, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So he was very hardcore. Like, you know, if you, you, if you make one mistake in Arabic grammar, you will do 20 push-ups. And then you'll stay in push-up position until he calls on everyone else. And then it's your turn again. And if you make a mistake in one uh, conjugation of a verb, you do another 20 push-ups. If you get it right, you can get out of push-up positions. You'll stay in plank, basically, until you go around. So the cool thing about the class was... You got you're, really fit? You're, you're, either you're going to learn Arabic really well, or you're going to be really fit. You know? So you win either way. You know? so, so, so for me, I was the guy who was doing this homework and this and that. And the thing is, they were not progressing. They were not moving forward with the classes. Yeah. So I'm just like... And, uh, and just the whole mentality of the thing, I'm like, what is, you know, what is going on? And that, then I started to... I began to understand... Why everyone who's looking at me and I'm telling them I want to go learn Islam, they're like, you know, son, you you're such a smart kid. Why why would you want to go learn Islam? Like, why would you want to go to like an Islamic school? Like, mm -hmm. you're you're smart. That's for like dumb people. Like, why would you do that? And I began to understand the mentality only later because what I'm what's happening is two things are simultaneously happening. I'm in this curriculum doing this stuff, and I'm like, this is not what I really want to do. But I'm continuing to read all the books on the side. 
So while I'm reading all these books on the site, I'm reading Abul Hasan al Nadwi, I'm reading about Western civilization, Islam, and Muslims, how the Muslim world in the 20th century has the effects of colonization, uh, the effects of decolonization. I'm beginning to understand that I'm piecing together this narrative of something has gone wrong, right? And, and this still, is the manifestation of it in front of you. Now. Exactly. So yeah. now, now I'm beginning to understand this is exactly what has happened. This is the thing that has gone wrong. Yeah. So I still have in my mind this mentality that, uh, you know, there's got to be some golden age, you know, Islamic school out there that I can find mm -hmm. and it's going to be like the place for me. You know? So that's what I do. I leave that school and then I joined the pre IOK before it was IOK. So no, IOK was there. So I meet, I meet Sheikh Noman. Uh, Farhan was my classmate. Uh, mm -hmm. Sheikh Farhan was my classmate in UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. So I go and I join IOK, and I'm like, okay, well, this is much nicer in the sense that uh, you know Sheikh Naman is a, he's a he's an intellectual guy. He's a business professional. You know, he was a mm -hmm. tech as well. He's nice. He has good character, good akhlaq. So for me, like on the akhlaq part, I'm like, this is perfect. This is a lot better than what I was experiencing. So what they're trying to do is they were trying to like revise the madrasa system and make it like nice make it like uh, more compatible with like our cultural values. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the curriculum, at that time, at least, it was almost the same thing. Uh, it was taught in a nicer manner, but again, the focus is either on law and the focus is on, uh, you know, Arabic grammar and stuff like that. So I'm like, you know, what? okay, I can, I can put up with this for a while uh, as long as I'm progressing. What ended up happening was, is that, again, it was in its infancy, infancy stages, the other students who were there, they were a lot more serious than the previous ones. But they weren't serious enough to be doing their homework completely. So for me, I'm like, look, this is my entire life mission. Like I left my school, I left everything behind. This is my 100% occupation. Nothing else matters to me except this thing. So I'm doing all my homework, I'm advancing this and that. And what keeps happening is students are not really doing their work and this and that. So they end up going and repeating. They say, oh, well, we're going to repeat the same material again. Oh boy! That's... Be, so I'm, I'm I'm like, look, this is that's not fair, you know, because like I did my homework. Why do I have to go through the same class again? And then it happens like a second time and a third time, and I'm just like, no, this is too much now, you know. So I um, I'm trying to find a private teacher, uh, who can just kind of like teach me on the side or something like that. I can't find anyone who's gonna dedicate full time for me. Obviously, it doesn't make sense. Like you know, who's gonna dedicate the entire day to just keep teaching me the whole time? So that doesn't work. So I'm like, look, I need to go somewhere. I need to get out of here. There's got to be a solution for me. So I tell my parents, I'm like, look, I have to go. And they're like, you're not going at all. But what we'll do is we'll make a deal with you. Here's the deal. Because you're not finding what you want in California over here. So here's what we're going to do. You finish your degree at UCI. Go re-enroll. Finish your degree. The moment you finish your degree, we're going to let you go to India, where you wanted to go. So I'm like... They thought you would give up. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they're hoping, right? So, so like, he's gonna get the comp side degree, get a they, job at Google, and forget they, forget they, any of this ever happened. Exactly, yeah, that's yeah. what their expectation was, right? So I go back in, I'm, I re-enroll before twelve months are up. I'm back in, and but I'm back in, but something is totally different about me because now I'm Muslim. I'm still reading, but now I have this value for knowledge, right? So like, I care about the idea of learning not so much learning computer science as a career but just learning in general right? i just have a different perspective because when you read those books on islamic thought and everything the, there's this importance of knowledge in general which helps you through life so now i'm just not coming in there like i just got to finish a degree mm -hmm. i do value the knowledge but at the same time i want to get this degree quickly done and i want to get to my real knowledge that i need to so you're, you're like laser focused now you're you're no exactly yeah exactly so now i go take a full load of classes and I end up making up the entire year that I missed by just taking a full load of classes. So I finished, graduated in like three years. MashaAllah. Right? So, and, and you know, it can be done actually less than that. So yeah, people at UCI, the computer side guys, they, yeah. do, they do it every year. Yeah, yeah so, so Sheikh Munib, he's uh, you know, someone else in our community. So I, when he was joining UCI, I told him, I'm like, look, you know, I'm a latecomer to like valuing knowledge. You grew up in like a very intellectual family. Mm -hmm. You're an educated guy. You are, you know, you're intelligent. You're doing computer science at UCI, I guarantee you. If I did it in three years, I'm telling you you could do it in two years. And he's like, that's not possible. I'm, like, I'm telling you you can do it. 
It's taking so, like 20, 30 units a quarter or yeah, a semester? Just you handle, you handle the whole, including summer, right? Just do summer oh. as well, yeah. So he kind of disappointed me. He did it in two years and one quarter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he, he could have easily, if he just put a little bit more effort, he could have easily done it in two years, right? The thing is, you could do all these classes in two years. So I come in there, just di different mentality, right? So I go in there, finish all my classes. At the same time, I'm still reading and studying. I continue with IOK before it was IOK. You have excellent time management skills. Marshall. I don't have nothing else yeah. going on. <laughs> nothing shame. else happening, right? Yeah. If you don't mind me pausing the narrative, because you made a jump here. So you took a year off. Yes. And I wanted to ask you about that. Do you? So you obviously had a rougher time doing it. But nowadays, there. Are, so when I was in Texas, there were a lot of kids at Qalam. And yeah. the Qalam Institute is in uh, Texas with Sheikh Abdel Nasser Jengda, Sheikh Hussein Kamani. Yeah. Very great institute. And they do like a one-year Anemia program. And they have lo longer ones as well. But... What's your perspective now that we have kind of established in institutions here in the U.S.? Some student, he's in college. He's, he's two years in, maybe less, maybe more. He says, I want to take a year off to go kind of study my dean, so to speak, just for a year. Do you think that, do you encourage those kind of things? Or you say, like, finish your degree first, don't fall behind, so to speak, mm. on your no. progress? Or should you do that, come back? I absolutely encourage studying your dean first. Because here's what's going to happen. Any, any program, a university program, pretty much... Uh, across the country, it's going to have a liberal arts, you know, uh, yeah. curriculum. So you're going to have to study either philosophy, anthropology, sociology, psychology. You're going to have to study something that has uh, a non-technical aspect, which is going to affect your understanding of your worldview. It's going to affect your worldview completely. Yeah. Is it better to have a strong Islamic foundation when going in, or to go in and then go and try and fix whatever mm -hmm. little brainwashing has taken place, right? Uh, I'm definitely a proponent of the first one. Between high school and college? Is that between probably ideal? Apps, yeah. Ideal is between high school and college. And if it's even possible, have a good, strong high school curriculum while going through. But yeah, outside of that, right after high school, I recommend getting accepted, deferring your enrollment for a year. I mean, Mormons do it. You know, the, the LDS church. Everyone has to And then do they this. go on their mission. They go on yeah. their missionary. They have to finance it themselves. I mean, I can talk more about that in detail, but they have to work in high school to finance themselves to go make missionary work around the world somewhere before they jump into college. And they're still getting into great colleges. They get into a good career. Like, it's very doable. It's not that it's not doable. So, yeah, my advice is right after high school, take a year off and go straight into, like, some Islamic studies program. So solidify yourself. Now two things are going to be accomplished. Number one, you get into university. You're going to be protected. Mm -hmm. protected you're gonna not only protect it but you're gonna be able to filter the information that you have and actually contribute to the discussion in yep. a completely different way so it's not just about protecting yourself like living in a bubble it's about being able to contribute to the knowledge discussion that's taking place number one number two your experience in like a Muslim student association is gonna be totally different you can actually contribute to the MSA. So now you're a producer rather than just a consumer hoping that if my MSA is strong, they're going to make me strong. Now you can actually yeah, help <laughs> make your MSA stronger. <laughs> you guys know that experience. Exactly. Yeah. So Cal Poly slow, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, credit, right? Yeah. <laughs> we were supposed to say that. It's better now. It's better now. It's better now. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So yeah, I mean, I definitely, yeah, I would, I would recommend that that's ideal. That, that, that should be the standard for I think Muslims. nowadays it's even more important over the past uh, half decade or so things have gotten really out of control Absolutely. in the university yeah. so this is uh, I mean you have to what's funny is you're saying to undo the brainwashing that happens in college a lot of it's happening now middle school high school yeah. Yeah. so by the time you get to your Islamic thing between high school and college you're like what yep exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then you're gonna go to college hopefully you've kind of laid some foundations yeah <clears throat> exactly so what if uh, hypothetically yeah. there's no institution around you do you know any institutions that someone could study through online? <laughs> yeah, good question. Yeah, so that's where uh, I that's, started. This is time for the plug. This is the plug, right? Yeah, go for so, it. so that's why I started California Islamic University, right? So that's the, that's what uh, a kind of a curriculum, a kind of more balanced curriculum that I wanted for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's structured, it's professional, it's organized, and you could do it potentially online. So you're living in Alabama somewhere, and you're like, okay, you have a family like mine that's like, you're not traveling anywhere. You're gonna stay right here. Well, what do you do? You got two options. Either take off one year, or if you're jumping into college, or even if you're senior year of high school, you simultaneously do an Islamic curriculum online while you're doing your regular school as well. And that's gonna really give you a solid foundation to protect you and to make you someone who can actually learn 
uh, be it contributing, you know, Muslim mm-hmm. on campus. So I, I, I highly, highly recommend people yeah. do that. You know, yeah. uh, ideally, if you could take off the entire year, that's great. Yeah. If you could take off two years, that's even better. You know, I mean, again, it, it, it's this is not about people becoming scholars. Mm-hmm. This is about this is the cost of living. In, yeah, it's, it's, this is what you got to know. It's the cost of living in Western society, right? It, it, you know, a lot of immigrant parents are not understanding that this is not back home. You can't just leave the kid and all of a sudden he's going to naturally just grow into the same way he would have like in Syria or Palestine or, or where then he's playing five times a day exactly yeah. exactly it doesn't matter how religious you are that took a village to do that we don't have that village exactly and, yeah. and, and also even in those places it that's changing that mm-hmm. we, we you know with globalization the influence that's coming into those places that was a generation ago yeah right it's changed Right? And, yeah. and, and even, if, even if that was your minimum standard, which it shouldn't be, because there's a lot of weird practices you know, that are yeah. going on there. Even if that was the minimum standard, you're not even going to reach that minimum standard. That's the cost here. You have to invest yep. extra yeah. time. People need to wake up to that, yeah. wake up to the reality. So now there's alternatives that are there. So Cal Islamic is, is an, an option for an alternative. And there's a lot more alternatives yes. out there, yeah. which is awesome. You know? Alhamdulillah. So, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Can we go? Let's go back to the narrative, though. We okay. want to. We want to make it. We want to make it to your eventual, uh, like where you're sitting now. So, um, how do you? Where we were at the. He's, he's contributing back to his MSA. He's oh, you're contributing he's back to his MSA. I re-enrolled in college. You re-enrolled yeah. in college. Okay. You, finish you finish it, uh, it real quick. Full time, full time schedule. I'm reading right. on the side. Yeah. And what's happening is because I'm reading, so I'm not really part of MSA technically at this point in time. You're too busy. No, not so much too busy. So here's what's happening. It's like, uh, you know, and I fault myself for this, but I'm, I'm telling you what my mentality was at the time. Okay? Got it. I'm not telling you what I believe about MSA now. Okay. So what's happening is I'm reading all this stuff and I'm coming in and I'm praying with the MSA people because pray, we pray together as Muslims. I get that part. But then when I look at my MSA or MSU for UCI, right? Um, <laughs> they, you know, even though MSU... Uh, at UCI, even in my day, was one of the more active MSAs in the country. From my perspective, I'm going and reading, and I'm coming in here, and I'm realizing it's more of a social club. Yeah. Right? And people are socializing, and a lot of them don't know very much about Islam. And they don't take Islamic studies as seriously as I'm taking it. Right? So for me, I'm coming at a totally different, you know, uh, perspective. So I'm going in there, and they're like, "Come on, man, you know, socialize with us." I'm like, "Socialize with you? Like, I'm, I gotta go read. Like, I'm supposed to. I'm here to learn about Islam. You guys want to come and like read with me? Do you wanna, uh, you know, start learning Arabic with me? Do you wanna? Hey, you wanna read some of these books? And they're like, "No, no, let's just hang out. You know, we're just gonna have like a hangout thing." So for me, I was very. Uh, I was not into this whole hangout culture, right? And I understand now... Some people need it. That's what I'm saying. Some people need it. There's a a very important value that it plays. But during my experience, at that time, I'm just like, look... It's not for you. I don't need this, right? Like, that's good. It would be nice and fun and all that. But first of all, keep in mind, like, with all due respect, you know, I love my Muslim brothers and sisters, but like, I'm coming from a non-Muslim friendship culture, right? Yeah. So... The, what do I have in common with most of these Muslims? Like, it's just the Islam part, right? So for me, it's it's hard for me to even socialize with them because I've been socializing with like non-Muslims my whole life. The the type of things that we do, we talk about, and all that. I'm still in a transition phase. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's hard for me to even socialize with them because I'm not used to that. It, they're not like if I had a hundred people to choose from, I wouldn't just choose the Muslim if I had you know yeah. anyone to socialize with. So for me, the socializing part is not important for me. It's the knowledge component, the knowledge part that's really important for me. And I, yeah. and I felt like there was almost like a pushback uh, against me at the time. Like, this guy's just... I, I, people kept saying, you know, you, this guy's too serious. You know, something's... You, guys, you gotta be more chill. Like, you know, why are you so serious all the time? You come in here and... You know, and I would... It's not that I wouldn't smile. I wouldn't talk to people. But people just had this issue that, you know, this guy's just, just too serious. You know, so he doesn't want to hang out. He doesn't want to socialize for a long period of time. So that was a uh, an issue that I had, and then things would start late, and I'm like, w- w- where's the where's the revival? Like, and I was reading about Islamic revival in like different uh, yeah. countries. The wrong part of the exactly. <laughs> so I so I started a project called Project Revival, basically revival of Islam. I posted up notes like you know on on the MSA wall, like you know we're gonna start all activities on time. 
prayer will start on time. You know, we should never make commitments unless we're going to keep them. I got hadith references on the side and everything. I'm like, you know, who's really dedicated? Who's going to sign up, you know, to do this? I was getting frustrated like a lot of the leadership. They're not waking up for Fajr. I'm like, dude, we need Fajr network, wake up network. We need to get this in, in progress. People are like, man, why are you being so serious, man? You're bringing like this, <laughs> this seriousness aspect into MSU. It's funny it's, your seriousness is like the base level it's of It's the base now. level, exactly, exactly. So, so for me, that's kind of weird. And now all of a sudden, the way I get recruited into MSA or MSU is basically they realize, hey, this guy is not really into this whole socializing thing, but this guy seems to be like more knowledgeable than we are. Why don't you come and teach us? So I'm like, oh, okay. You want me to like teach a class? But like, I don't even know anything. Like I'm, I'm a brand new Muslim. They're like, no, no, you know a lot more than we know. So I read a few books, right? Mm -hmm. So they're like, teach us. So I'm like, okay, I'll teach you. So I start a class. I start like an Islam 101 class. Then I start a Sira class. Then I'm learning Arabic. So I, taught you, I start an Arabic class. So I start getting students. I don't even know Arabic completely. I know like, <laughs> I know like I'm on chapter 10. So I start teaching from chapter one. Right? So, and then so, some people come and they're like, you know, they're Arabs. And they're like, Man, you know. Oh yeah, they're definitely like this Pakistani. Look at this Pakistani. Guy. <laughs> this dude don't even know Arabic, and he's gonna teach an Arabic class. I'm like, look, I'm doing this because no one else is teaching. Why don't you teach the Arabic class? They're like, no. oh no, I can't teach Arabic class and this and that. You know, Arabs know their Arabic and blah blah blah, and we're getting into debates on Great grammar. Misconception. And, yeah, just you know, hey, a big misconception. You know, this guy knew his Arabic, by the way. Some people they know the Arabic because they come from Arabic country. They go through Arabic medium. Their grammar is good, everything. They have no passion to teach. Oh, yeah. So they're not gonna teach. They're not going to do anything. So I'm teaching all these classes. That's how I kind of got sucked into MSA, I say, in, mm. in a sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm doing that. And then, yeah, and then I start to socialize with people. Uh, there's an importance dawah related element to it and all that. That was pretty much my experience with the MSA and MSU. And then, then they start making me do khutbas, you know? So now all of a sudden, I start doing khutbas. I'm like, well, how did this happen? I'm like the latest guy. Uh, I'm like the latest addition to Islam yeah. here out of, out of all of you. Why would I be the one giving khutbah? And it's just basically the simple thing. It's like if anyone who can read like three books on Islam is basically the most knowledgeable person in the entire MSA. Like if you just take one person, like an average MSA across the entire country, okay? If you just take one person, you take him out for one week and you educate him, he'll come back the most knowledgeable person in the entire MSA probably or maybe number two. Right? And that's just the reality of like No, this is this is a great point. And yeah. you were talking about how you couldn't I'm socialize laughing, but with it's it's the, true. With the Muslims versus non Muslims. What's funny is so I went when I went to college, I wasn't like a big, big part of the MSA. I knew like Ahmed from freshman year, right? So I knew the MSA members, but I was living with non Muslims for the first four years. Mm. What's funny is the deepest conversation I had philosophical, intellectual, whatever, those conversations I had with non Muslims. Because those guys they read books and I read books. So we could have like actual conversations about something that's not what you eat, where'd you go to, what is this hadad, not hadad? Like, you know, there's yeah. there's like a real substance to a conversation. I, know it's, I mean, it's really sad yeah, that... It is sad. Yeah, yeah I didn't sad. read, so I... I yeah, we, we were yeah. talking about stupid stuff. Yeah, it, <laughs> but see, here's the thing. So, one, we need to encourage that. I think yeah. what you're saying is a good yeah. point. We need to encourage that. And number two, we need to... We need to facilitate that for people who are interested in those things. So what's happening is, even though, you know, you may meet a lot of people, you don't know who's interested in this stuff and who reads and who doesn't read it's very hard so what mm. happens is you're so used to like oh well what's uh the, the latest kebab shop that just opened man they have the best kebabs so you you get into that socializing mode and you think everyone's like that and you don't realize hey this guy i could have actually talked to him about something way deeper but we end up talking about like the kebab shop or something like yeah. that right so we need to change this narrative we need to facilitate like some kind of spaces like a book for club? A, or like, like a book club or a discussion club or something like that where people who are a little bit more well read are going to be attracted to come there and you know not necessarily the incentive is to have a good discussion yeah. you know you don't even need to have like the best coffee or something like that yeah. so i think we're we're focusing too much on the superficial aspect of like you know and your coffee was great by the way but like we're focusing on like Thanks to my wife. That's, yeah, that's alhamdulillah. Not, not me. alhamdulillah. There's the masculinity part of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But the thing is, like, we're, when we're talking about, like, we're going to develop this Muslim coffee shop, the, the, the idea is, well, the coffee's going to be like this, and the design's going to be like this, and it's going to look like this. Well, where's the... The coffee. Where's, no, where's the substance of it, yeah. right? Yeah. Where's, the, uh, the, where's the intellectual discussion? What are you trying to foster here? Right? Is, is it... Uh, is it uh, I wouldn't want to say superficial, uh, socialization, but just kind of like 
recreational socialization yeah or yeah. some kind of like it's like the nine to five social when you go to work these guys talk about nothing no, i just nothing I, of real <laughs> substance to be like oh we connect about right. something i don't know right. i mean i i know that msas they, they do tend to be more social clubs but coming from someone who definitely needed that mm. i know a lot of people also yeah. needed that too I, that's what Th- I'm saying, that yeah. You know, that within itself stopped someone from going to a party, stopped someone from seeing their girlfriend yes. that night. And that might have been enough. I, I, you I, know I, I agree. Mean? I agree. That's why uh, I say in retrospect, when, in I look, retrospect, when I look back, I'm like, that was extremely valuable. Like now, we have, Everyone's not going to fall into that. But I'll, I'd say most people need the socializing as a priority. Yeah. And the knowledge stuff is like second for them. In terms it's of funny like, if you want to summarize all Muslim youth problems, like really superficial summarization. Yeah. They had a bad, bad friend group. And at the end of the day, yeah. they were with the wrong crowd at the wrong time of their life. If they had yeah. been with a good crowd, if I was with a crew younger who's praying five times, like, yo, Munir, we're going to go to the masjid. What are you just going to do what the guys tell you to do? That's right. The peer pressure is to go to the masjid in real yeah. long, That's what the peer pressure is going to tell you to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The most religious guy in our MSA was the guy who prayed five times a day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> when I showed up, he's like, whoa, this guy prays five times a day. <laughs> and I was like, and you didn't? Like, what? what is, you know, what is, what yeah. is so... Uh, we had one guy who showed up and gave, like, a khatara one time. And we were like, oh, mashallah, this guy's like really knowledgeable. But then he ended up leaving and saying we weren't serious enough about Islam. Mm. Turned out he was Ahmadiyya. <laughs> <laughs> Twist. And we didn't even know what that was until we're like, wait. Until he, told us, until he told us Jesus already came back, we're like, mm. we were, oh, yeah, we found out at an MSA function, like an MSA 101. Interfaith. Interfaith. And then they're talking about different groups believing in Jesus and then what the, our guy was like oh yeah we believe Jesus is going to come back and and then this guy raised his hand and he's like oh well I'm Muslim but Jesus already came back and we're like the whole room just kind of goes <laughs> silent <laughs> so that guy was more knowledgeable than everyone else subhanallah subhanallah alhamdulillah but you eventually you eventually graduate I eventually graduate and you and go overseas I, I, I go straight to my parents and I tell them I said you know what promise is the promise right I kept my promise to Allah you know in my capacity and you're obviously gonna keep your promise and they're like uh, uh, no <laughs> <laughs> no no that's not gonna happen like you know you were this this fad of Islam was supposed to dissipate by now like what's wrong with you like it's been like two years you should have like this Islam thing should have been out of your system by now so uh, like no you're not going anywhere like you know you need to go go get a job like like no, go get a job and then go get married and settle down and, and I'm like no I really want to go they're like well uh, get a job and then we'll talk oh I'm just my God. Like, come on this is this is not fair you know yeah so I said okay fine I got no money now so I lost uh, all the stock market remember <laughs> <laughs> never never got uh, since that margin call came in uh, the margin from my father was cut off as well so all oh. that because he knew what was happening right so he once he found out I was running away all my accounts are completely cut right so I have zero money yeah I'm completely dependent on parents now whatever little amount of independence or trust they had in me was completely just fizzled yeah f- pulled out from, from under me so now I'm now I'm done. I have no money. Graduated. Parents paid for tuition, so I don't have loans, which is good. You know, most people today have like loans and stuff. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So I start applying, get a job. So I get a job and I'm sitting there doing really good. Uh, you know, my mentality also has changed, right? So I'm like, you know, very punctual, very hardworking. Because I'm, I'm reading in these books that Muslim is supposed to do all these things. So they're like, man, this guy's like star employee. You know, it's like to the point where my boss is telling me that like... Uh, you know, you need to just slow down in terms of working. <laughs> this is this is a problem because you're working so fast. We don't have projects anymore to give you because you keep finishing them. So the next time I tell you that a project is supposed to take a week, it better not be done in one day. Did you work for yeah. the government or something? No, no, <laughs> I work for a t- <laughs> <laughs> Silicon Valley would love you today. Uh, yeah, what know, is going know, on? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm working for a tech company. It's like a company called Aqueduct, and uh, you know they're they're telling me like, okay, you know. We brought you in this position. You're doing great, but you just you need, you need to, to slow down. You need to slow down because it's making you're us so look serious. Bad. Chill. Yeah, you're, 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 you're done. And it's like you need to chill out. And I'm like, all right, fine. So after a few months, I, I'm making you know pretty decent money and everything. I'm living at home, so all the money is going into my account. And then as soon as I just have just enough, like three months or something, I'm like, you know what? I to come and tell my parents. I'm like, you know what? Do you want do you want me to go? To, you want to send me to India now? They're like, no, I keep working. I'm like, well, now you can't stop. Because now I just reached a threshold where I have enough money to go and pay myself. I can go on my own and I'll figure out the rest later. And they're like, oh, this is, this is a big problem now, right? Like this guy is actually financially independent now. He's got enough money and he's really going to do it. 
So what can we do? Like the last, the last uh, you know arrow in their quiver or the last thing in their arsenal mm-hmm. is okay. I tell you what, there's this dream you've always had. You've had that Ferrari Testarossa poster on your wall when you were a kid. Do you remember that car? I'm like, yes, I remember that car. So we know you. You like that car, right? I said, yes, I like that car. So if you don't go, we're gonna go to the dealership and we're gonna buy you that Ferrari. Whoa! Don't go. A Ferrari. Ferrari. <laughs> Ferrari. Right. So, and my parents are very well off, you know, Mashallah. so Alhamdulillah. So, and because it just think about their mentality. They're so afraid of what can happen to me. Here there, is dunya. Right? This is, <laughs> this is dunya. But again, in, in retrospect, they're giving it to you. They're, no, in retrospect, no, they're, they're afraid they're, of what they're, they're afraid. Yeah, they're afraid. Yeah. In retrospect, they're afraid. That's how, that, and that's sad because that's how afraid they are. That's how scared they are. Right. You, you and, know, that's and in a way, in a way, actually they had some legitimate concerns. Okay. Like again, they are living, they are coming from Pakistan, technically. Even though my dad was born in India, they don't know anyone in India, right? So if they would, if they would have, if I would have chosen Pakistan, maybe they would have been a little bit more comfortable, perhaps. Yeah. Pre-9-11, especially, right? But, but this is post-9-11 anyways. Yeah. So they're, they're, they would have been a little bit more comfortable. But this is India. They don't know a single person in the whole country. There's no connection to this land at all. Got so it. a foreign country, uh, their perception of, you know, Madrasas are already not good perception. Maybe the perception of India itself is not perception of India against yeah. Muslims is yeah, a problem in and of best. itself. Yeah. Uh, you got uh, this Orange County kid. How the heck is he going to live in India? So he couldn't take the the, he couldn't po- take the, peeing, the pooping hole in San Diego. Exactly. He's not going. You know, he didn't want the shower on the, on the <laughs> hole in the wall toilet. This guy's going to you know live in India. Uh, oh God. And then and then he's an American on top of that, right? So you walk around with an American passport. And he's going to be spotted immediately. Now, I don't understand these things until I get there. Like, people can see you from a mile away. I don't, I don't get that. But they know that. They're like, you know, they, can, they will tell that you're an American from a mile away. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know why, that, why that would be. So they have a legitimate concern. In retrospect, I understand their concern. So if some, you know, some kids are like, yeah, my, my parents are doing the same thing. Same. I'm like, you know what? They, they have some legitimacy yeah, in what yeah. they're saying, you know. So, but anyway, so I'm like adamant. I'm like, no, this is the place. This is the only school that I think is going to have uh, the Imam Ghazali type that I'm looking for. Like, yeah. Sheikh Abdul Hassan Nadwi is going to be my teacher or something like that. Based upon what I've read on their website, based upon the books that I've read from him, based upon some other books. So we go and we visited the school and this and that. And my dad went with me and uh, he, he saw that people are kind of nice and you know, things are comfortable. So I tell him, I said, I am going. So their last option was, look, here gonna buy you this dunya and don't go you can still go to a local islamic school here we're not going to stop you but you don't go over there and you get this car and you enjoy and you can you can drive up and they're like once you become an imam you're going to be the coolest imam you're going to drive up in a ferrari and you'll be like the ferrari imam ferrari you'll be the ferrari imam right like, don't you want that and then like some of my other friends are like yeah, dude that would be really cool man you know so i'm just like you know and i'm like that doesn't fulfill what i'm trying to get right because i'm not finding here what i'm trying to get yeah so i'm like no mom dad it's not going to happen i'm i'm going whether you like it or not so i make a decision i tell them i'm going so all of a sudden they back off and they're like okay you know what since you're going you know what we actually are supporting you so they wanted to like they switched their position they're like yeah yeah we will pay your ticket and everything like that so in the end they end up supporting me like right before i'm leaving and they're like yeah you know we're gonna we, we don't really like what you're doing but if this is what you want you do it so i end up in india Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. And you spend, that's where you, Islamic studies. No, 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 no. So I, it starts. It's, oh. It starts in India. But then the struggle, like you said, it's not linear. Uh, you know, it's not a linear process. So my coming back to Islam was not a linear process. My studying Islam was not a linear process. So, okay. So I go into India. I get there. Um, you know, just summarizing some of the things. I get there and, and, and this is the same madrasa you visited with your father. same yes but let me explain something they put you. on the facade when you so when you visit when you visit a place right it's like like this university researcher coming from like harvard going into like some random desert land right and they come in with all their supplies and stuff and they walk in and they see all the people they're like this is so interesting you know these these people live a primitive lifestyle <laughs> and, and you know oh look look at the type of food that they eat they'll sit down like have a meal like oh this is very interesting food and so but but at the end of the day you're just gonna go and live back in your hotel and you're gonna fly back and that's it it's totally different lifestyle for you so that's what my visit was like oh this looks 
pretty nice everything exotic, looks yeah. look exotic <laughs> yeah exactly so like a romanticized version of like everything looks pretty cool you sit on the floor during classes this is going to be really interesting but when you get there it's just totally different when you have to live in that environment it's just totally different especially if you're coming from orange county right so yeah orange county is a very uh, nice suburb here in uh, socal yes, so it, that's it, uh, yeah it, yeah i have a cousin in, in england they're like oh there was a show uh called orange county is it true that you guys pay like ten dollars for a bottle of water in like newport beach or something like that? i'm like no that, that's a little bit exaggerated six dollars it, 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 it's, it's about six dollars exactly yeah. so the thing is people even know now about the, because of the show they know yeah. about this orange county you know it's, it's pretty like a nice posh area it's, it's supposed to be a good area yeah so i'm coming from that's my whole life is spent here okay? yeah so born and raised here grew up here i visited different parts of the world but you know you didn't live it, it like that so you, you live in a four star five star hotel yeah right i visited india when we visited india we literally stayed in the hotel that used to be a palace converted into a hotel right so that's where we're staying so you live in there like in jaipur it's like this used to be like the palace of the prince or pasha or whatever and then we turn it into like a five-star hotel now so if you're living there but then you go to the village like in the day and you're like wow this is really interesting how these people eat like their uh, lentils and their rice and let's join them for a meal like yeah i've experienced india no you have not experienced india until you live there like yeah. you're, you're living with the people and you like you're there so i get there i arrive and uh, my dad is very worried. He's concerned. He's like, what's going to happen in this and that? So he calls in one of his contacts, a contact of a contact, and says, hey, somebody knows someone in that school. Identify, hey, there's an American student coming. Please give him some special attention. So they're like, okay, we're going to take care of this guy. We're going to give him special treatment. So here's the special treatment, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and th see, for, for, for them, no, no, for them, it, it's not like what you're thinking, maybe. It's for them, it's, it's special treatment for, from their perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Special yeah, yeah. treatment from their perspective is this. I go in and they're like, we're going to keep you in the guest house. Nobody besides like VIP stay in the guest house, okay? So I'm like, in the, I'm like, wow, I'm in the guest house. This is cool. Like in the, in the VIP guest house. The VIP guest house was like this. The first night I arrive, okay? I get there, there's like 12 or 16 beds across in one room, and one light stays on, and I just, I go under my blanket, I go to sleep, I wake up, and I wake up throughout the night, there's mosquitoes just literally biting me throughout the entire night, right? My face is puffed up completely, and there's like just this line of just mosquitoes, and they're not attacking anyone else. They're only <laughs> attacking me. They know that I'm American, right? So they knew I was Fresh coming. blood. Fresh blood. Exactly. So they're like just right above me. They only hover above me. They don't go to anyone else. So I'm like, okay, this is the worst night of my life. <laughs> I'm like, it's a, this is a horrible. And they're like, don't worry, don't worry. We, you're staying in the VIP room. We don't want to move you to your dorm room yet. We want you to enjoy. <laughs> I'm just like, if this is enjoyment, okay, this is a problem, right? So I'm sitting there living in the guest house. Your room is not ready yet. We're going to give you a special room. There's normally six people to a room. I'm getting one with two people to a room, special VIP room. I'm like, okay, great. So I'm living there, going. One week passes, I'm inside the guest house. People told me, be very careful of your diet, watch what you eat and this and that. I went to REI, I bought uh, military grade uh, water purification. Iodine you know, stuff? Yeah, the, like, no, no, iodine is like primitive. We're talking oh. like top, top of the line, it like, uh, you, you like zap the water or something like that it can even kill uh, some type of you know you can just get water off the ground and you, you can get water off the ground you mix it in there you you, yeah. get, you purify your water so i'm like this is awesome so one guy told me i'm, I'm like i'm i'm taken care of he goes no no we're gonna get you some bottled water because you know you're a foreigner you're an american we'll take care of it for you i'm like okay i appreciate that you know here, here's the money get, get water i need so brings me bottles of water a six pack of giant one liter bottles of water I come in there, first time I try and drink it, it just stinks, it reeks, right? And I'm just like, what the heck, this water, this smells so bad. It's like you've been using a plastic bottle for like a year, and you know that it starts uh. to smell, it's that smell. So I'm like, I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's bottled water, it's brand new, it's, it's gotta be okay. And I just keep on drinking it, I'm just like almost vomiting. And I tell this guy, I'm like, you know, something doesn't feel right about this water. And the guy goes and smells it and he's like, oh my God. He's like, the, guy, the guy's ripped us off. You know, sometimes this happens in stores 
where they just use old bottles and they repackage them with normal water. So what you've been drinking. What the you, hell? Yeah. So the first day I arrived, I've been ripped off with the water that I got. I got water that has been bottles that have been used for like years, repackaged with normal water. So I got gypped day one. I got mosquito bite, you know, on the same day one. So I'm sitting there, sitting in the guest house, very miserable. Okay, one one week passes by. Okay, I think I arrived on a Friday, so I didn't have to pray Juma that day because I was traveling. And then one week passes by, I haven't showered yet. I'm thinking about that sermon that I, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that sermon. I need to, I need to shower. And I, I'm a guy who like, I need my shower every day. I can't function. Maybe that's a, a yeah. That's bad how thing. it is. That's yeah. how it is in America. That's right? how it is in America. You shower I, in the morning. You or shower, in the evening. yeah. And I need a shower. I feel horrible. So I'm sitting there and I'm sweating and I'm like, you know, and it's winter time. It's freezing. There is no heater. VIP house. There is no heater. Heater doesn't exist. You have walls. Uh, that's the VIP. That's part. the VIP. You have walls, <laughs> exactly. So I go in there and I'm like, okay. I go in the shower. I'm like, it's it's too cold, man, to take off my clothes. This is like freezing. And then the shower is a bucket shower. So you're gonna put water. It's gonna go into a bucket. Mm. I don't even know how to use a bucket shower, right? Like, what do you what what do you do exactly? Like, yeah, you scoop up the water and you kind of like pour it on yourself. I'm like, okay, I can do that. So I'm waiting every time I go. I'm like, it's too cold, it's too cold. A few days before Juma, I walk in there and I see this and I'm very, at that time I was very scared of roaches and spiders, two things I don't like. So I walk in there, I see this giant spider. It's like, it's like this big and it's like right next to the handle. And I'm like, no, hell no, <laughs> this, no, this is not happening. So I, I walk out. Finally, Juma comes and I'm like, all right, it's, I haven't showered in a week. It's been seven days. I haven't showered. I'm stinking. I'm sweating. It's Juma. I have to shower now. I have to do something. So I'm going in there. I don't care. I'm going to face that spider. I'm going to get this guy. So I go in there, got my clothes. Everything's ready. Go in the I go in there. I see the spider kind of chase him off. He's still there waiting for me. He waited the whole week for me, by the way. <laughs> you know, so go in there, chase him off. I go to turn on the water. There's no water. Water's <laughs> done. And I'm like, what the heck? Why, why, why is the water done? So I asked the people. They're like, it's Juma, man. Don't you know? If you want water on Juma day, usually the water is done by around 8 a.m. You're like, you're late to the game. It's like 9 or 10 a.m. Water gets done. You should have showered early, like before Fajr or after Fajr. Otherwise, the water is finished. You have to wait till tomorrow. So I'm just like, I've been one whole week without a shower. I go for Juma without a shower. And I'm like, this is what life is going to be like. Like, this is, this is what I'm experiencing. I get into my dorm room. I have... I brought a bunch of granola bars with me. People said you have to accustom yourself to the food. Mm -hmm. So I bring, I've been eating granola bars for an entire week, okay? I have all the trash saved up in my suitcase. I'm collecting it in a bag. So I'm like, I got all this trash, you know? I'm looking around the campus. There's, there's, is, no, there's no trash can. There's no trash can. So I'm just trying to figure out, I'm like, you know, where do they keep the trash cans? So finally, I have a roommate. My roommate starts explaining to me how like life works over here because he's Indian. And I'm like, you know, by the way, I have a question about, you know, where do I throw my trash? He goes, the, uh, the trash? You just throw it outside. It, it's outside. And I'm like, I didn't see any trash can. Said, no, no, it's just outside. I'm like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean outside? Said, no, just throw it outside and some, it'll be taken care of. People don't explain very much. They don't explain in detail. So I'm like, what does it mean it's going to be taken care of? Oh, someone's going to come and he's going to take care of it. Like, oh, I got it. You have a trash collecting service. So you leave it outside on a certain day. And the guy's going to come and collect it for you. He goes, yeah, yeah, just throw it outside. I said, okay. I'm gonna laugh. <laughs> so I throw it outside. Finally, I saw him like, the trash is sitting outside. Every day we walk out, the trash is all trash. Plastic, everything just sitting outside. We have to walk by this trash every day. I'm like, where's the trash guy? You know, you said the trash guy is coming. We're like, we're walking in trash. Right? This is the, outside the school, the, the whole street, every street is lined literally up to this table in trash. That's the way the city is, okay? It's an Islamic school. That's the city. That's the city. And, and in this Islamic school, I'm like, but we got to be better than this. It's, I'm like, there's no way. This is Islamic school. This is not going to happen, right? So we're walking by the trash, and he goes, no, no, it's because school hasn't started yet. <laughs> so you know what? The, the trash guy's not here yet. So he's late. He's a little bit late. He's a few days late. I said, okay, fine. So then finally, I find out, oh, the trash guy's here. I'm like, alhamdulillah. I knew it, man. I knew it. <laughs> alhamdulillah. <laughs> Trash guy arrived, he's gonna pick up the trash. Man, this guy's like days late, we've been walking in trash. He comes up, <laughs> he lights a fire, <laughs> lights the trash on fire in front of the room, all the plastic, everything, and he leaves. 
and it just burns. <laughs> so the whole day, the trash is just burning inside in, in front of my room, and it's it's plastic burn. I mean, it's That's very that, that is not healthy. <laughs> extremely unhealthy. And, and forget scroll. for the environment, we are inhaling all these fumes, right? And I'm just like. You gotta be kidding me, man! Like you know, he's an arsonist. You know, this is. Uh, I'm like, this is his job. Like you pay him for this. Like, I could have done this. this. Like, I so could have lit it myself, I man. <laughs> so I was just like, I'm like, for me, this is like massive culture shock, right? So I'm just getting to the point. And I'm like, look, man. Look, I, I, I need, I need to like recalibrate myself. Okay, I last time I visited this school. Things were looking good. I saw the English library, awesome books on Islamic studies across the board. So I'm like, man, let me just go to the library. I'm going to chill out and go to the library, <coughs> English section. The English section? Oh, that's not open for students. It's only for researchers and professors. I'm like, why? I read English. Oh, these the English books are very expensive, right? So because it's a poor country. So I don't have any access to English books. My Arabic is not fluent enough to read the Arabic books. So I'm sitting there. I'm going through this curriculum. Culture shock going on. It's to the point where school starts. I start to learn almost the same subjects. Grammar, Grammar. Islamic sure. law. Oh, the students who are there, they're not interested in being there. And most of them are not very serious. Now, again, in the higher levels, there's a lot more seriousness. But I'm sitting in the lower levels, right? So I'm sitting there. I'm trying to study. Uh, I'm getting my food. Just so many things I'm going through. Like my food, you know, I, I just I have too many stories to share, right? There's there's a lot of stuff going on, and it just makes life very very difficult for me. Teachers don't show up on time. Some teachers don't even show up for the entire year. So I had one one <laughs> Wait, for what? the whole year. Wait, what? The whole year. Who taught you? So it's just, on on that subject, this this guy, he showed up. Uh, Actually, in my year, he showed up a little bit more. In the third year, third year students, the guy shows up for one week, doesn't show up for the rest of the year, and shows up for the last week. He shows up for the first week and the last week of school. So, and, and you have to be in class for attendance. Who's so, taking it? Like the TA? There's a TA? There's like a TA or something, or a, a student is appointed as TA. So everyone has got to go to class. Take more tea? Uh, yeah, I'll take some more tea. So student goes, everyone goes to class. You're going to get marked that you're present. You're going to sit there, wait for the teacher. He's not going to come. You're going to chill out, socialize with the guy, and then you're going to leave. Just like, this is not Madrasa Nilamiya, right? The, again, my thing is like, yeah. how can, what's going on with these standards? So is this, is, this is bothering yeah. me, right? Uh, the, you know, the food is bothering me. I mean, mm -hmm. the food is, it, it, conceptually, everything's looking good. Sheikh Abdul Hassan al Nadwi, he made a new policy where, Food is going to be sent to your room, delivered to you, so that you can keep on studying. He wants these students to be like top notch, right? What happened was Nadwa used to be a really top elite school in like the 60s. Then enrollment expanded tremendously and kind of the standards went down, right? But it's still a very good school in terms of the research, but I'm not at the research level. I'm yeah. sitting at the very basic level. Yeah. So food comes in. And guess what you get for food? Every day you get the same food. Rota. You get uh, a naan, mm -hmm. you know, like the naan bread. You get dal, which is lentils. Mm -hmm. You get rice. And you're supposed to get some meat because I have an upgraded food schedule, which we paid extra for, a food, like food uh, plan. And what actually happens is all of that meat never makes it to you because during Zohar prayer is when they start dishing out the food. So all the students go to the prayer obviously we're supposed to be praying we're in an Islamic university while we're in prayer the, 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 the servants or whatever the people serving the food they go and put the food inside the thing so about maybe 20% or 30% or more of the students they skip the Zohar prayer to go get the meat they go to the food guys and they kind of like pressure them or threaten them or pay them off or whatever it means all the meat's going to come into our things all the meat is done we get like the bone that's left over all right, so I'm getting this bone, I'm getting my rice, I'm getting my lentils, I'm getting, it's enough to survive, right? But it's, but what bothers me, what bothers me is not so much the food. It's the fact that you paid for something, you're it, supposed it, to get it. It's not even, it's not even that. It's the fact that, you know, again, I'm coming from, in, I'm at that time, I'm coming from, uh, hey, people got to be serious in Islamic school, right? So I'm like, these people are supposed to be here and they're skipping prayer to go and get the meat? Like, you know, that's, it's just, it's bothering me. For me, again, mm. you have to keep in mind. The integrity of it. In, yeah. in my mind, I have like this idealistic version of the, what the ummah is supposed to be. Like at least 
what the Islamic university is supposed to be like. Now, in retrospect, I understand all of this. You know, I, I look at it from a very different angle. In retrospect, I'm like, look, you know, a lot of not everyone goes to school because they want to be there, right? That's every field, every career. Islamic school is no different. But that's what I'm going through. So it's 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 becoming stressful for me. It's mm -hmm. bothering me. The type of you know, they're switching curriculums. Uh, people are not that interested. And then you know, one day one of our teachers makes a mistake in uh, some basic math on inheritance. And I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, man, look, like, you messed up on the fractions. Like, you know, I'm computer science major, right? Like, I my my math is pretty decent. Like, you didn't do this problem correctly, and he just you know kind of like waved it off. He's like, no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, look, I, I don't know my Islamic studies, but I know my math, right? <laughs> you you messed up on the math, right? And uh, he just kind of played it off. So I'm just like, you know, you know, again, everything is affecting me, right? Yeah. So this. Some of the teachers, uh, you know, be explanations as affecting me. Some of the teachers are amazing. Some of the things are bothering me, right? So I get a private teacher. He's teaching me. I, I go at nighttime uh, to, to his house. While I'm on my way, all of a sudden, there's a, like a, a moose. A, a moose or an ox or something like that on campus that basically, like, intercepts me and, like, blocks my path. I'm just like, what the heck is this? what the heck is going on? <laughs> like, I can't get to my teacher's house who lives on campus, okay? Because I've been intercepted by this like ox by a beast of burden. By, by a beast of burden. <laughs> <laughs> At nighttime, the lights are not functioning properly, and I, I didn't. I, it, I didn't know what it was in the beginning, so it, I'm, it I'm makes just, this I'm weird sound. I'm honestly surprised. Sound, this right? is, I'm surprised you didn't qu like you haven't quit. I'm about, I'm, about, I'm, I'm, about I'm, I'm about to. I'm about to. I'm gonna tell you about to quit, right? So I get it. It sounded like this crazy. It made this crazy sound. I've never. I've, you know, I yeah. didn't live on a farm, right? So it made this crazy. I thought it was. I'm like, oh, dude, I believe in jinn now, 100. percent Like <laughs> this is a jinn, and the jinn is following me, and. And I found out like it was an animal and it was literally obstructing my path exactly to get to my teacher's house. And I would try to move around it and it would go around and I'm just like, what the heck? What the heck is going on, man? So like I literally like had to like you know, outsmart it, run that way, and then I sprinted the other way, got to my teacher's class, and I'm like, what the heck was that? Oh yeah, that's like a, a bison or something like that. I'm like, why is hold on. Why is there a bison on campus at nighttime? Outside of your house, <laughs> why is that there? They're like, oh yeah, you know, they keep them in the back, you know, in the kitchen. So probably one just escaped, and you know, <laughs> it just happened to, you know, it somehow it just it caught you, <laughs> like you know, it liked you for some reason. I'm just like, you know, and I'm looking out the window. I'm like, I'm not going back down there. <laughs> like you, you need to get this thing out of here before it's gonna attack me. So just like weird stories like that. I'm just dealing with this on a regular basis. So it gets to a point where I'm just like, you know what? I can't, I can't handle this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm like, I'm, I'm quitting. So I leave. I come back to America, and I'm like, my parents are like, see, we told you so, we told you so. All the, all the told you so's in the world are like there, and I'm just sitting there, like kind of in like semi depression. Uh, I rejoin the pre IOK what it uh -huh. used to be, and I'm like, I'm doing that, but again, still their classes are not up to that level. <clears throat> so one of my friends from Nadwa in India convinces me. He's like, look, you need to come back. Like, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're not doing anything with your life. You're not, uh, you know, you're not progressing. You, either you give this up completely, or you come back because there's no other place you're gonna go. You can't just be in limbo like that. Yeah, exactly. I can't. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So while I'm doing that, I'm doing a bunch of things. I'm, I'm doing some Islamic classes with like the pre IOK before IOK was there, uh, and then I get a job as. Uh, an Islamic uh, high school teacher, Muslim high school teacher, just on the side, a few hours. And then I'm just studying all day by myself. So I, I resume the curriculum. I'm like, okay, you know what? I will continue. So I keep studying the curriculum. I'm in touch with some of the people over there. I'm like, where are we in the curriculum? I'm like, eventually I'm going to come back someday. I'm like, I just, I need a break right now, but I, I'm going to come back. A few months later, I'm keeping the curriculum. I'm like going into massive depression. And I'm like, you know, I can't do this. I'm, I'm going back. So I get my ticket, I fly back there again. I still enrolled in the school technically, I just I had left in the middle. So I come back, I'm where everyone else is, and I'm just like, wait a minute, you know, what I had studied on my own, I'm kind of like at more advanced than some of the students here. I'm like, what what what's going on here? They're like, you know, just finish the curriculum. My friends are telling me just do it. So number of things happen. Number one, there's this guy, one of the teachers on campus, 
he he calls me it's a very tribal society right so he calls me in and he's like you know uh, you need to come visit me and I want to talk to you about some things. So some students warn me and they're like, he's trying to recruit you into his little little gang. And what's going to happen is he's going to basically, it's like politics, he's going to control you, then he's going to, you're going to become like his murid, like his, uh, uh-oh, uh-oh. You know, his it's, follower, it's like a cultish yeah, thing, yeah. right? You're going to become his follower. Spiritual you, abuse. Ex- exactly, right? So it's like, you're going to have to come in here and he's going <laughs> to own you then. So he's, there, I'm like, what should I do? He's like, well, you have a big dilemma because if one of these guys invites you, uh, for for tea in his private gathering, he doesn't invite people normally. So if you refuse, you've just made an enemy. And if you accept, you've just like joined the gang, basically. Like you've taken your first step. So I'm like, this is so ridiculous, man. Like I, I came in here to do Islamic studies, not to like play these politics games. And I'm like in my hardcore phase, like very hardcore. Um, everything is, little things are bothering me. Like I go in there, you know, the principal, everyone stands up when the principal walks in the room. And I'm like the pseudo Salafi kind of guy walking in there like, you know what, man, I, I ain't standing for anyone. So I'm like the guy who just sits there, everyone else stands up. And I'm like, I ain't standing up. I got a hadith to back it up. You know, like, I'm not getting up, you know. So I'm in that really hardcore phase, right? So again, that's par- partly my problem. Not everyone's going to experience this, right? So I tell, I, I tell this guy, I'm like, you know what, no, you know, thanks for the invite, but I'm not coming. So now this guy becomes my enemy. So now, and he's one of the teachers, and one of the senior teachers, a very powerful teacher. So I'm like, this is so ridiculous. Like, this kind of politics has to go on. So now this guy starts to get some of his people, like, to cause a problem for me. And they're like, look, they're going to cause a problem for you. I'm like, this is, I'm just here to study, man. This is like high school all over. This is like, exactly, this is like high school. Like, what is this? You know, like little kid stuff, you know? So now... What are you going to do? Take my meat from my lunch? It's exactly, too late. It's already, it's already gone. It's already gone. It's already gone. Exactly. <laughs> So what ends up happening is one of their guys puts an accusation and spreads a rumor that I wow. am an American spy, right? You go, why is he an American spy? Because he's visited India three times. He went once, once the first time he came to visit, second time he comes, and then he leaves, goes and reports information to whoever, and then comes back for the third time. I'm like, this is such a, you know, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. First of all, what am I going to spy on exactly? Like, well, what, what is what is there to spy on? Number two, like, look at my background, man. Like, do I look like a? Do I fit like the profile of a spy? Like, you know. So and there's I that. Couldn't just send an email. I had to go back. Yeah, seriously. You know, like I had to fly back. <laughs> had to fly. Exactly. So I'm like, so now I got a problem with some of the students going and spreading a rumor that I'm an American spy. Just, just is really bothering. I'm like, this is so stupid. Okay, number one. Number two. Uh, number two is the biggest thing. So I go, the second time I go there, I start eating out with like my friends. School is on lockdown, you can only leave a few times, or you can only leave half a day, once a week. So I, we figured out a way to kind of bribe the guards, because uh, like students know what to do. So you buy two biryanis, you know what biryani is, yeah. So you buy two biryanis, and that covers you for a whole month. You know, for the security guards, you can get out whenever you want, you can come back whenever for you want. For a whole month? Whole month, yeah, it's, it's, I told you, it's that's like a cheap, cheap That's a cheap, cheap bribe. The cheap standard a- of living, you know. So two biryanis cover you for the whole month. So I start going out and eating at all these different restaurants. And one of these restaurants, <clears throat> I meet this guy who is kind of like a semi-gangster, but had joined the, joined the school as well. He hated the school, always complaining about the school, and I just kind of clicked with, I'm like, I like this guy, dude. Like, you know, anyone complains about the school, I want to socialize with you, like, I'm, I'm down with you. So we get together, and it turns out this guy's like a little bit too much of, a uh, little too aggressive. You know, he's been getting in fights at school and stuff. So he takes me out to a place, we get some food, and then he goes to the guy, the chef in the back, and he takes like, I think he had a, a toothpick or some kind of metal toothpick, and he puts it against the guy's back. And he's like, you see my friend over there? He's from America. You're going to make this food up to proper standards, right? So I'm just like, man, you don't do that to a guy. Like, you can do whatever you want. So, so he makes this food, and my suspicion, okay, I can't prove this. My suspicion is that guy did something to the food, okay? Because right after that, I get typhoid. <laughs> I get, I get typhoid and the thing is typhoid is if you don't know what typhoid is it's a type of like it's a type of food poisoning your basically your temperature goes to 104 degrees and it stays there and you have no appetite so you don't want to eat anything you don't want to drink anything so I'm oh, sitting my. in my room okay I'm by my room very treatable but not in your not, no, not, not over there not over there not over yeah. there no yeah. no so, yeah. and the thing is, so I'm sitting there I'm just 
literally, I have a fever, 104 degrees, nonstop. I'm taking Tylenol, goes down, comes right back up, 104. It continues for several days. I'm not going to class. I'm sitting under the blanket. I'm not drinking water. I'm not eating food because I don't feel like it. I'm just drinking green tea. My friend is making green tea for me, and that's it. So finally, I get to a point. They're like, you know, you should, you know, you should try and get out, get some air. I'm like, look, I'm like, I'm dying here. Like, this is really, really bad. So my friend, you know, he's like, you know, you should do something. Finally, after a few days, I'm like, look, you know what? Just. I, I'm done, man. I, I think I'm gonna like I'm gonna die here. You know, just call nine one one and and we'll, we'll we'll get out of here. And he just starts laughing at me. I'm like, dude, I'm I'm like messed up. Why are you laughing? He's like, man, you still don't understand. This is a guy from England, by the yeah. way. This is Sheikh Owais Namazi, by the way. So this oh. was my this was a guy who really you know helped me a lot, took care of me. I'll never forget everything he's done for me. So he's a guy who's coming from a Western country, so I can relate to him. He's helping take care of me. So he laughs at me and he's like, you don't understand where you are. <laughs> there is no 911 over here. You don't just call an emergency and like an ambulance is going to show up, man. Like you, you are not in America anymore. You're in a different part of the world. So I'm like, well, what happens to people when they're like this sick and they're like on the bed? He's like, and he, I remember this exactly how he told me. And he's totally serious. He's like, they die. I was just like, they just... They just died? Like, it's like, yeah, it's not such a big deal. It's like, this is not America. It's like, you're on your bed and you die. And people will do janazah and they make dua for you. And I'm just kidding. You just I'm, need an IV and, and something. I'm, I'm like freaking out. I'm like, what? What in the world? Like, did you just die? I'm like, he's like, yeah. So I'm, I'm just thinking, this is what's going to happen to me. I'm like, this is a complete failure of a mission. Like, I have not got my Arabic up to par. I have not gotten most of my answer, questions answered. I'm like, this is gonna be the the, the dumbest, use, most useless, pointless death like ever. <laughs> so, so I, that's what I'm going through. So then I I said, there's gotta be something you can do, man. Like, can you like save me somehow? He's like, you know, I can call one of the sheikhs and he's got a connection and we can get you to like a nice hospital. But he's like, I'm telling you what's gonna happen in that hospital. It's the hospital. Maybe worse for you than like you just kind yeah, of you know being here. It might reuse the needle like yeah. they reuse the bottle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so and, and he's like, you don't want to do. You don't want. I don't know if you want to do that. I'm like, at this point, man, just do anything. I I need to get out of here. So they send me a taxi, take me to like the top hospital of that area, which is not very top. So I go in there. They put a needle. They couldn't even find my vein. Then they're like, they they like take it out. Like blood is squirting all over the the sheet. So like I'm sitting there. With like blood, like blood on my bed sheets, right? And then they, the first thing they come in there and they're like, "Oh, what kind of room would you like?" I'm like, what do you mean? A VIP. Th that's the. Uh, so you know what it is? Would you like a regular room, a fan room, or an air conditioning room? So I'm like, what? That, like these are the options. So my friend away, you know, he's it's like a half joker. So he comes in there, he's like, "Man, look, I'm gonna be visiting you the most." Dude, I, we're going with AC. I'll pay half of it, man. Like, because there's no AC on campus, right? Yeah. So he's like, I'm paying half of it. We're getting the AC room. I'm like, all right, fine. He's like, trust me, it's gonna be better for you. So we get the AC room, sitting in their hospital. All he's, all they do is pump you with IV. That's their their entire treatment. There's nothing else to do. I got blood like on my bed sheets, not being cleaned. It's just sitting there, right? And I'm just sitting on an IV for like I don't know how many days, right? And I'm going through like depression. I'm yeah. like, this is, this is, this is. Like the sacrifice, this is what I get, you know. So, because of these reasons, you know, long story short, uh, I'm like, it's time for me to leave. So yeah. I leave India, and I come back to America in a state of semi depression. Uh, get a job again as in uh, computer science, uh, and while I'm sitting in that job, I'm like, you know what, I can't, I can't do this. I'm not supposed to be here. So I end up leaving that job again. All right for the, another job and I end up going for Hajj from Hajj I go to Egypt spend a year in Egypt from Egypt I end up going to France for three years and then I end up coming back and that's how I finished my studies Marshall. how many years is that total so that was five five years five and then I went again to England afterwards got master's degree so okay and it's it, you're pretty uh, like what was the degree in like just Islamic studies or uh, no shari uh, Sharia Islamic law and theology yeah, sh okay Sharia so Sheikh I want to another pull another lesson out of this and this yes. is something I've seen in a lot of teachers when I talk to them about their overseas studies yeah. is it's not fancy 
and there's no glory in it it's not as as you said you're romanticized yeah right yeah so i find a lot of people when they go overseas even when we my wife and i we did an arabic studies program very short nine months it was in texas it's in america cockroach infested apartment for six out of the nine months i lost yep. internet at the last three months like you know every little mini struggle that a lot could throw at us right yep. they're not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things but I find that when people, when they go and study this dean for Islam, Allah doesn't make it necessarily easy on you. It's not like, oh, life's good. Now I'm just going to study a full time and everyone's going to love me and I'll come back to this glorious uh, life or whatever it is. Yep. And I think there's something in that. Maybe you can comment on it. Why, why do you think there's a, a struggle aspect with studying Allah's dean? Shouldn't he make it easy for us, so <clears throat> to speak? Yeah, I think there's two aspects. You know, One aspect is there's got to be a struggle because... If you're supposed to get all this reward, you're supposed to get all this benefit of, you know, having a deep understanding of the religion, uh, you know, people who go and seek knowledge are on the path towards paradise, Allah will make the path towards paradise easy, all that's, all those ahadith and verses about the the greatness and excellence of knowledge, it's not going to come for free. It's gonna, mm -hmm. it's gonna, there's going to be a price. So in the past, people like Imam Bukhari, all these people, they used to travel months their life was in danger while they're going through deserts. You know, they're being Imam Ghazali himself was uh, attacked. You know, in robbed, a caravan, yeah, he was robbed, robbed. All his yeah. notes were taken away. So that challenge has got to be there. So this idea that you're not going to encounter challenges j just because, and that's the notion that a lot of people have. A notion that I had since I made that one step, right? Of like, okay, I want to be committed, a committed Muslim. Once I made that one step, now everything should just be smooth sailing downhill from here. That notion is wrong. That notion is very, very wrong. It's not that there's not going to be progress, but a lot of it is you have to you have to make sacrifices. You have to be ready to struggle. So that's number one. Number two is that people uh, oftentimes will glamorize uh, these other countries, Muslim country, Islamic university. Uh, even some teachers will do that, you know. So some of them will put it down and they'll criticize, you know. That's kind of more of my style, just to give people a reality check. And other ones will just kind of be like, no, no, let's not tell them the bad things. Otherwise, they're gonna not be motivated enough to go there. So there's kind of like a, a marketing of, you know, oh, Medina University, it's, it's in Medina, and uh, you know, Darlum Dioband, it's a 200 year old institution, or Al Azhar University, it's like this. Um, and what's going to happen is when you when you glamorize that too much, people's expectations have kind of been lifted and then yeah. they get broken. I think that's very dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. And it depends where you're coming from. So if you're someone who's coming from, I keep saying Orange County, like if you're, if you're someone who's coming from a very uh, middle class American lifestyle and you're you not used plumbing. to that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you have, you have, you grew up with air conditioning and heating. You grew up with running water. Okay. And... Uh, you are going to have a very difficult time adapting to any circumstance. If you went there to study medicine, okay, and you're in medical school, you would have a difficult time. Yeah. So that's just the nature of the <clears throat> cultural shift, and it, that needs to be pointed out to people. And mm -hmm. you need to understand, you learn who you are when, you, when you're put into circumstances like that. So what, what I do say, though, in, in retrospect is, again, my mentality for people is, number one, if you're someone like me who was just trying to learn Islam, right? Oftentimes you need to have, a, it's good to have a good understanding of Islam to be able to deal with the challenges that you're going to be facing. So this is my, my problem is when people are only teaching Arabic, like let's say someone goes to learn Arabic. Yeah. You're only learning Arabic and let's say you have very little knowledge of Islam and you go through the challenges that I have. You're stuck with typhoid, for example. You get sick, you get in the hospital. What what did you learn in the last six months that's going to help you get through the struggle of the health issue that you're going through? Nothing. Because what are you going to do? You're going to conjugate verbs, Arabic <laughs> verbs? Be like, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to console myself by doing some conjugations. That's not going to help you. But had you taken, let's say, a class on spirituality or tazkiyah, you talk about the importance of having patience. You have all these verses you have explained to you. You have all these hadith that are explained to you. Now you're like, oh, okay, I know kind of how to react, how I'm, at least theoretically how i'm supposed to react yeah. right so so that's why kind of like for me the curriculum should and that's be, where the islam is learned that's where the islam is learned so yeah. the islam part is the key the specialization part can be like the arabic and all that other stuff that's why for my curriculum that i made the islam part is in there in the beginning because you need that because if you go through struggles you're going to have you need some knowledge to help you process through those struggles if you yeah. don't have that 
it's just going to be another problem. So, I mean, that's one thing that people need to understand uh, before going in. And, and if they're already there, they already got that, they're like, they're ready for the struggle, they understand what they're going to go through, they understand that it's not an ideal golden age Islamic mm-hmm. society, you're not walking into Madrasa Nidhamiya, <laughs> you're not going to have, you know, Fakhruddin al Razi and uh, Imam Ghazali and uh, Ibn Rushd as your teachers, okay, then, you know, maybe you're prepared for that. But one last thing I'd say is, is that the idea of Islamic studies uh, now, you don't have to travel. You, you can do a lot of this in America, right? I still think there's a valuable component for that life experience. Honestly, when I, when I look back, my experience in India was one of the most important experiences of my life. It was a very difficult experience. Uh, I wouldn't want to go in there without knowing, you know, with, without knowing that I'm there for life experience. But if someone understands that this life experience is going to shape you as a person and they can go in knowing that it's going to be like this, it's going to be tough. Here's some examples of what can happen. I think that life experience sets people apart, those who just academically study Islam versus those who study Islam and have this life experience. Mm. Right? So I don't regret any of that when I look back. When I'm living through it, I'm like, this is the worst experience of my life. But huh, that's the way life is. You, know? you always look back and you see that there's... There's an immense wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And it makes you a stronger person. Much stronger person. Yeah. You know? And that's why, you know, a lot of times people are like, you know, you're one of the few imams who like wants to be an imam or like hasn't just keep changing jobs all the time. And I'm yeah, like, because yeah, you already saw the tough part. I have a, I have a very high tolerance level. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're like, how do you deal with these masjid boards? I'm like, you know, masjid boards, man. I had a guy trying to recruit me to become his murid, put a rumor on me. <laughs> I had a guy who, you know, is threatening another cook, giving me typhoid. I mean, I the stuff that I dealt with, I'm like these uncles are annoying, but they're not that they're, they're not as like I can't not that I can't handle them. Right? Yeah. You know, so, so it's kind of nice when you when you, know, when you when you look at those things in that perspective. Definitely, I know we didn't really get a chance to go into our main topic. <laughs> are you still okay for staying, or are I'm you? Good. I'm good. Let's extend. Shall You're good. We can uh, extend. We can Alhamdulillah. Extend. Yeah. Part two. <laughs> 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 you have to tune into the next episode. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I'll split it inshallah. Yeah. Why not? It's so. Yeah, I guess we can. We can do that because, yeah, I mean, this has been two hours now. This is going to be our longest podcast. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah, things are going good. Yeah.